All right, we're going to get cranking. <clears throat> the board now reconvenes this meeting of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees in open session at 7 p.m. on May 22, 2018 at the Plano ISD Administration Building. I am not <coughs> Missy Bender. Board President Missy Bender is unable to be here tonight. I'm David Stolle, Vice President of the Board of Trustees. On the board's behalf, I wish to extend a warm welcome to all who are present and to our web and video viewers. <clears throat> we will conduct our meeting focusing on the district's two major goals, ensure continued improvement in student learning and ensure efficient use of resources. Let me introduce my fellow trustees and staff. Seated to my left are Sarah Bonzer, Superintendent of Schools, Nancy Humphrey, Board Secretary, Trustee Tammy Richards. Trustee Jerry Chambers is celebrating the graduation of her daughter from West Point this evening and cannot be here. Seated to my right are Trustee Dr. Yoram Solomon, Trustee Angela Powell, and Executive Assistant to the Superintendent and Board of Trustees, Denise Gillespie. Did it say that you're not using Yes, it did. <laughs> Trustee Nancy Humphrey will offer tonight's inspirational message. Ms. Humphrey? All that respect, my goodness, thank you. <laughs> As we begin tonight's meeting, I want to remember those who are impacted by recent tragic events. They are in our thoughts tonight as we all carry on. We always find a greater outpouring of human compassion, bravery, tolerance, courage, generosity, and selflessness despite the adversity that we face. Tonight as we conduct our meeting, let's focus on the impact of our work on those we serve in this community and help spread the hope that the work done in this school district will prepare our students to make a difference for this world. We look forward to celebrating our distinguished graduates on June 9th and cheer their success. We also look forward to serving the students who will be entering the next grade to ensure Plano ISD's um, education maximizes their maximum potential. And now will you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Actually, let me invite some yeah, oh, let's invite so our sorry. student guests. We'd like to welcome our student greeters. Come on up for this evening. Tonight, winners from the Texas State National History Day competition are here to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. These are students from Plano East Senior High and Rice Middle School. Will everyone please stand and students, lead us in the pledge when you are ready. I think it's here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Students, we thank you for being here tonight to allow the board to recognize your state wins and the hours of work you put in to get to this level of success. Dr. Katrina Hasley, Assistant Superintendent for Academic <coughs> Services, will introduce this recognition. After Dr. Hasley's introduction, students, we would like to hear from you. So please introduce yourself and tell us your name, school, and the title of your History Fair entry. Then Board Secretary Nancy Humphrey will present your certificates. Katrina? Yes, thank you, Mr. Stolle. The History Day experience provides students with an opportunity to explore their interest in history and while practicing and refining their skills, historians use to study the past. The theme for this year's competition is conflict and compromise in history. Students compete by selecting a topic related to the theme. They conduct research using primary and secondary resources and analyze their findings. They present their work by writing historical papers, conducting performances, or creating exhibits, websites, or documentaries. Tonight, we have one student from Rice, Elementary, Rice Middle School, excuse me, who won first place in the individual performance category. And we have two teams represented from Plano East Senior High <clears throat> from the senior group exhibit category. The 11th grade team won second place and 12th grade team won first place, I believe. So now, as Mr. Tully has asked, if you would each introduce yourself, tell us your school, your grade, and the name of your um, project. My name is Madala Sa'ayer. I'm in seventh grade. I go to Rice Middle School. My project was titled, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh. Did it matter? A compromise that led to conflict. Hello, my name is Anit Chanara. I'm in 12th grade. I go to Plano East Senior High School. And our group, 
group performance was titled Mandela and Tombo, The Unseen History of South African Conflict and Compromise. Hi, my name is Neil Jayarajan. I'm in 12th grade also at Plano East. Us three are all in the same group, so we have the same project. My name is Trun Yadula. I go to 12th grade and I'm also in the same project as them. Uh, my name is Alvin Toff. I'm from 11th grade, uh, Plano East Senior High. And the title of our project was A Diamond is Forever. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Shiva Tirdala, and I'm an 11th grader at Plano East Senior High. And us four are in the same group. My name is Isra Mustafa, and I'm an 11th grader from Plano East Senior High, and I also did that project. Hi, my name is Susie Chang. I'm an 11th grade from Plano East Senior High, and we're also in the same project. Members, would you like to offer any remarks? Well, I, I would as well. I'm awfully proud of you all. I think uh, <clears throat> I'm a history buff. I love history. Always have. Um, and the, uh, the, the the lessons that you can learn through looking at the past are val invaluable for <coughs> the future. So, well done. I'm happy for your interest and, and continue that forward. And I just want to say thank you for finding ways to get involved in meaningful things and experiences at the school. You know, you have choices to make in how you spend your time. And the fact that you spend your time doing things that are worthwhile uh, means a lot. And, and so keep that up. And so for our middle school and our 11th graders, you know, we can't wait to see what you do here next. And for our 12th graders, congratulations. And I think the next time we see you, we will be shaking your hand on a stage. And so we look forward to the next opportunity to see you very, very soon. So, and good luck in your futures. So, looks well, and, very bright. And they are not done yet because students who earn first or second place at the state competition will advance to the National History Day contest in June. We wish you luck in that next level of competition. Now, if there are our staff and family members able to be here tonight in support of these students, if you would please stand and let us recognize you as well. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, caller, uh, Carla Oliver, there she is, <laughs> Assistant Superintendent for Government, Community, and Planning Initiatives is made aware of student guests prior to the meeting. Do we have any, Ms. Oliver? So would Boy Scout Troop number uh, 219 please stand for recognition? Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Now in addition to the State History Fair winners <clears throat> that we met just a minute ago, the board is proud to recognize many more students who have recently achieved at the state, national, and international level. See the scrolling PowerPoint of student names popping up shortly. And we are also honoring Plano West Academic World Quest team who won the national championship, two Plano Senior High Chinese students who received full scholarships to study abroad this summer, 
25 students who have been awarded National Merit Scholarship Corporation $2,500 scholarships. Clark High School Investment Club, Club who placed 12th in the nation in the Te Texas Economics Challenge. The UIL State Computer Science Academics Competition winners from Plano and Plano West Senior Highs. Plano Senior High track and field teams which placed at the UIL 6A state competition including the girls state champion in the 400 meter dash. In career and technical education we have 10 BPA students placed at state. Plano West speech and debate teams extemporaneous speaking national tournament of champions earned first place sweepstakes first and second places. And we are honoring presidential scholar Catherine Lay from Plano Senior High School. 161 presidential scholars are named each year. Catherine is the 11th presidential scholar from Plano ISD since the program's inception. Please join me in applauding these accomplishments. <laughs> it's the board's pleasure to recognize Penny Chapman President of the Council of PTAs for her service to the organization and to the district. I will ask once again Carla Oliver, Assistant Superintendent for Government, Community, and Planning <coughs> Initiatives to make this presentation. Ms. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Stolle. Uh, and also thank you for allowing me uh, this opportunity to recognize a very special leader in our schools, Penny Chapman, President of the Plano ISD Council of PTAs. You should probably wave so they know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> During the past two years, I've had the great honor of collaborating with Penny and her PTA Council Executive Board. I see a few members here uh, with her to support this um, recognition. And they joined together in supporting the mission of PTAs throughout our school district. Penny has been an important part of PTA in Plano throughout her children's educational careers. Here in Plano ISD and her twins will be graduating um, next school year so she'll be a senior mom so we're talking uh, we're really over the years talking about a great contribution of time I would also like to express our gratitude to her family um, I don't see him here but your husband especially we've already talked about the twins I'm sure they're quite busy but there are plenty of times when he's had to share her with us as well and so I, I want to show our gratitude to their entire family, especially the past two years during her presidency because that really packs a punch. And then also for all the years that she's served our district through PTA. She exemplifies the PTA motto of every child one voice as she empowers her fellow PTA leaders to go above and beyond the call of duty in providing numerous services and programs to our local PTAs. During Penny's tenure as president, she and her PTA council have provided such opportunities as uh, leading, um, this is written a little differently, but I'm gonna say offer, uh, officer and chairman training, also leadership training, PTA reflections contest, one of my personal favorites, and award recognitions for students, an annual life membership banquet to honor all of their PTA volunteers, <coughs> A vendor fair was hosted. They have a legislative action committee, plus the annual PISD administration meals, which I can say I've also been a partaker of. Uh, local PTA program recognition, and under her leadership, two schools earned the National School of Excellence Des uh, Distinction, which is a national PTA program. And that's really just scratching the surface. I assure you there's so much more to add. But at this time, I would invite um, uh, Board Secretary Nancy Humphrey down to join me at the podium in presenting Ms. Chapman with a token of our gratitude. Penny, could you come forward? Uh, 
uh, Penny's assured me that this is not the end of our relationship together as co-leaders, but she's going to hang in there with me for a number of things as we also welcome in new leadership for our PTA. Penny, would you like to offer a couple of words? <laughs> or not, or not. <laughs> you don't have to do that. I do want to recognize our other board members who are here, Kelly Thomas and Jasmine Abawala, and Kelly will be our new Council of PTA's president next year, so can I ask them to Absolutely. stand and be recognized? <laughs> None of this happens with one person. It's a team effort, and fortunately, we not only have a team of volunteers that are amazing, but working with all of the Board of Trustee members, Superintendent, with you, and with all of the leadership team, I cannot thank you guys enough for indulging us um, when we want to talk about this, some things that are sometimes tough conversations. So I love that. Thank you for being here. You bet. Thank you very much. I want to say something. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Penny, I want to say something to you. I want to say thank you so much for your volunteer time and dedication to our PTA since 2006. She started, a, I think, a treasure at Heger Elementary PTA, and so that's like 12 years she have given almost all her free time to us. So thank you so much, Penny, for those years. Penny, I know I said this last week, uh, and I will say it again, I had the opportunity to talk to the uh, outgoing and ingoing uh, PTA presidents from each one of the campuses, and, and Penny gives so much of her time, but no one cares more uh, about PTA. In, in a long time, I have known a lot of people who work for PTA, and you give and you give and you give and you care, and it shows in everything that you do. And Penny is the true definition of a servant leader. She gives with no expectation of anything in return except doing what is right for kids and supporting families in this community. And I thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to lead alongside you. And I look forward to working with you in many new ways in the future. So thank you for everything. Thank you. I know I got to hand her the flowers, but I do. I echo all of those comments because I've been the liaison to the PTA and worked a lot with these wonderful ladies and gentlemen in the PTA. And we're true partners for the kids in this district. So thank you for all that you've done. And you always have the right words, always. So as Penny mentioned, that, that it's a team effort. So if there are family members or other PTA members here who are here to celebrate Penny, please Please stand and let's let us thank you as well. Or not. No. <laughs> Mr. Stolly, may I also add if I can throw in there that if there aren't family members to stand, maybe we should encourage our audience members to consider joining their local PTA or multiple PTAs. Um, we won't ask them to stand, but it is an oppor opportunity to encourage membership in our local PTAs and and it's very important and these the, the work that these people have done is a good example of why absolutely thank you Carla good point. this concludes our recognitions tonight we know this is a busy time of year and we thank each of you for taking the time to attend our meeting students you're free to leave <laughs> PTA members if you'd like to leave you may leave as well actually you're being asked to go to the lobby for photos We will now move on to the regular public comment portion of our agenda. <clears throat> For the public comment portion of our agenda, the board has public <coughs> comment cards that are accepted from 6 to 7 p.m. Cards are not accepted after 7 p.m. and are not transferable to other parties or speakers. All cards were collected and given to Carla Oliver, who will present the speakers during this time. Ms. Oliver, do we have any speakers? We do not have any cards turned in at this time. Okay, thank you. We will now address the consent agenda, which includes personnel recommendations, minutes of previous meetings, bids, purchases, and construction items. Are there any requests to remove an item or items from the consent agenda for further discussion? Hearing none, 
We have a motion to approve. I move to approve the consent agenda. I second. All in favor? Passes. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> With the approval of the consent agenda, I would like to invite Susan Modisette, Assistant Superintendent of Campus Services, to introduce the administrative appointment, are we doing, of a school principal, and Dr. Beth Brockman to introduce an administrative appointment in Human Resources. After the administrative appointment introductions have been completed, the administrative appointees and their families will gather in the lobby for photos. Ms. Modisette. Thank you, Mr. Stolle. I am so pleased to welcome uh, a new member to our Plano leadership team. Um, tonight I'm introducing Carmen Casamayor Ryan. Uh, Carmen um, is being named the new principal at Foreman Elementary and comes to us with just a wealth of experience. She uh, has been a, she is trilingual. Um, she has uh, taught um, bilingual education and has been so immersed in that, um, has been a Title I and bilingual principal in both Dallas and in Richardson, and um, currently is the director of Richardson's bilingual um, ESL programming. And so um, I'm pleased to welcome Carmen um, and her family to Plano ISD this evening. Carmen is here uh, joined by her husband, Joe, and their beautiful twin daughters, Kiera and Mara. Thank you. I am thrilled to announce that our new director for employee recruitment and retention is Clint Poole. He is here tonight with his husband, Scott Hamilton. Clint brings a wealth of information um, and experience to our district, not only HR experience from the, from the corporate side of the world, but also teaching experience. He became a, a teacher in Plano ISD and, and served for several years at Wilson Middle School. He's been a coordinator in our human resources department and an assistant director, and we are thrilled to have him uh, joining this new level of leadership. Clint. Carmen, welcome to the family. We're so thrilled to have you here. Family, thank you for coming out tonight and, and getting to know just a little bit more about Plano ISD. And we can't wait to get to know you better. And uh, we're excited to have you start. And can't wait to have you hit the ground running. So welcome aboard. And Clint, congratulations on your promotion. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, Bill is looking very, very happy this evening as well. So. Uh, I know that uh, everyone in HR, and especially Bill, is, is glad to know that he's got somebody to take his place that, that has a proven track record in human resources and understands the school business as well. So congratulations on your promotion. Now I believe you all have been instructed to go out into the lobby for photos, is that correct? Yes. Okay. After that, we're going to send everybody to the yeah. <laughs> right. Just take photos. Eventually, it's just going to be us. <laughs> we'll take our photos. You can come back. You can always come back. <laughs> That's right? true. Yeah, you're, you are welcome. OK, so we are now moving on to items for discussion and action. Uh, section 8A is uh, a discussion item, an action item to authorize advertisement of notice of public meeting to discuss budget and tax rate be presented by Randy McDowell. Randy? Yes, thank you Mr. Stolle, members of the board. Uh, we are nearing the end of the budget process and so we have this meeting, a couple of items, and then we will wrap it up on June the 12th. And the first of these items is the uh, authorization of advertisement in the newspaper on a budget and tax rate. I'm not seeing it coming up. Uh, you should also have a handout there that's uh, notice that, that is the official notice of public meeting to discuss budget and proposed tax rate. And so, so we'll be referring to that as we go through this. Uh, 
Okay, here we go. All right, so, so first, uh, when we look at the current tax rates, and as you know, we have two different tax rates. The current Ilmeno rate is $1.17. The current INS rate is 26.9 cents. And the total tax rate is $1.439. Uh, I'll show you why as we go through this, but we are proposing the same tax rates at $1.17 M&O, a 26.9 INS, and $1.439 uh, as a total tax rate. <coughs> uh, this is uh, one of the sections that is in the actual notice. Um, really the thing to look at here, so we talked about last year's rate, the rate to maintain the same level of revenue on the M&O, if we could go above $1.17, it would take a dollar, just over dollar twenty-two, to, to generate the same amount of net revenue for the school district as the prior year. Our rollback rate is a dollar seventeen because we cannot exceed that, and our proposed rate is a dollar seventeen. Uh, on the INS side, uh, we have similar numbers. Uh, the rate to maintain the same amount uh, to pay debt would be uh, twenty-six point zero one two cents in the calculation. Uh, when we go on to the next one, we just have the history of property tax rates. You can see in gray is the M&O rate, and the green number is the INS, or, or the green portion of the bar, and our total tax rate. So back in 06, 07, we're aware that they compressed the M&O tax rate from $1.50 down to $1, and we can see that our INS rate has, has been relatively steady over uh, this 13-year period. And uh, the $1.439, if it is adopted for the coming year, that would be the fourth year in a row at the same total tax rate. Our total appraised value for the current year is $59.8 billion. Uh, the coming year, uh, the 2018 value is projected currently at $63.8 billion. <clears throat> and when we take out all of our exemptions uh, and, and adjustments, the total taxable value in the current year is just over $51 billion and it's projected to be at 54.7. Uh, as you're aware, uh, these are just the preliminary numbers. We won't get certified values until late July. Uh, currently, the appraisal district is estimating a growth of 5.92%. Uh, and as you'll recall, we are budgeting at an 8% growth rate just because historically, uh, they've been somewhat conservative uh, as far as their preliminary estimates. And so we will see how that holds true as we get certified values uh, here in a couple months. Uh, this is a graph that shows the taxes on the average residence. And uh, if we just look at the last couple of years, the current year, the average residence uh, within Plano ISD, the average homestead, is paying $4,656 in taxes. And next year, uh, on the average residence, that's projected to go up four, to 4,896. And that is a $239 increase on the average residence. <clears throat> if we look at what that means as far as the portion of the average residence that Plano ISD retains uh, versus the amount that does get paid off to the state as recapture, uh, in 2014, on that average residence, $3,233 stayed with the district, and 311 of that was paid to recapture. Current year, 3,399 is retained by the district, and 1,257 is paid as recapture. And next year, on that average residence, it's projected that we would retain 3,231 and pay 1,665 as recapture. So a third of what we're going to collect for the M&O on that dollar seventeen, a third of this goes to the state. That, that's correct. We project that to be at thirty-four percent next year. And then, do you happen to know what inflation is at this point? Are we hovering around two percent? We're typically looking to two and a half percent. Okay, so our costs do continue to go up. They do. Yes, okay. ma'am. Why don't we look at the notice here, and I'll go through this very briefly. Uh, what, what the notice states is that we will have a, uh, a board meeting at 7 p.m. on June 12th here in this boardroom uh, where we will be adopting the budget. Our proposed tax rates that that budget will be based on are $1.17 M&O, 26.9 INS. Now, as you know, we don't uh, actually adopt our tax rates until we receive certified values. and. Uh, 
we will either adopt the tax rates in August or September. Plano has typically uh, adopted those in September. We cannot adopt a rate higher than the proposed rates. Obviously, we know we can't go above $1.17. On the M&O and on INS, we can't go above 26.9 unless we repost the notice prior to adopting tax rates. And so these are the limits. Uh, we can always come in and adopt a lower rate. Uh, the M&O budget in that next section you can see went up 10.6 percent. Of that only 2.1 uh, is not recapture. So the majority of that is just because our recapture is going up, our total expenditures are going up. So it looks like our budget got a lot bigger, but uh, almost all of that is, is going to be paid as recapture. A debt service is projected to increase by 9%. That's because our values are going up and also our debt payments are going up. It was structured uh, assuming that, that, that the property values would be going up and so we could pay a higher debt amount. Uh, the total expenditures when you combine the two uh, is a 10.4% increase the way that we have to calculate that for the notice. Uh, then you see numbers here on the current year versus um, the preceding year. So the current, so what we think of right now is the current versus next year. Uh, and, and so 50, again, those numbers that we talked about, uh, it does show the appraised value of new property. So uh, that's about 1.25 billion that will be added for the coming year in new property. Um, as far as appraised value and then the taxable value of that new property is 1 billion 134. Uh, total outstanding debt projected at the end of the fiscal year is 835,950,000. Uh, if you look on the next page at the top, those are the same numbers that we previously looked at. Randy, uh, the, the yes. 835 that you just mentioned, you said yes, at the end of the year? Okay. That will be at the end of the projected at the end of, at the end of this year, that's correct. Uh, in, in the comparison of proposed tax rate with last year's rate, I gave you those numbers in a slide. The average residence on uh, 1718 is 361,364, and the average residence increases next year to 377,600 uh, within Plano. The taxable amount of that uh, due to exemptions is 340,250. At the proposed rate, that's the 4,896.20 that was on the other graph, and that would be an increase of $239. Our rollback rate is $1.439 that we looked at previously, and our projected fund balances uh, when we remove uh, the amounts needed up until our first state aid payment uh, would be $139,514,000 on M&O and $18,487,000 on I. If we go back to here, uh, the budget tax rate calendar. So on June 12th will be the budget hearing and adoption of that budget. Uh, July 25th we will is the deadline for us to receive our actual certified values from Collin County Appraisal District. We anticipate to issue additional bonds in September. That will probably be about 14 million in principal. And those will be technology bonds that will have a short term and adopt the tax rate in September. Are there any questions on the notice of public meeting to discuss the budget and proposed tax rate? Randy, just a real quick observation. Could you go back one slide sure. to the transparency slide? I mean, three three observations on this. One is the reduction of the blue line and the increase of the red line is obviously a trend that we cannot that cannot continue. We we cannot survive with that trend continuing. Um, if you look actually at the amount of money taxes that we're retaining in this district we are back down to 2014 levels and that that amount has been reduced each year over the last three years uh, in a corresponding fashion with the increase in the amount that is delivered over to the state we are going to later on tonight look at adopting or preparing to adopt a negative budget for the second year in a row and this trend when people say, when people ask us, why can't you just reduce taxes so you're collecting the same amount and spend the same amount that you spent last year? The reason is because the state has a voracious appetite for our tax dollars in this district, and it is not going to stop unless something drastic is done. Something is done at the state level, and it has to be done. 
and this is an election year, we need people, our elected officials, to go to the state and fight against this because this district cannot survive this for very much longer. Well, and I'll point out also, <coughs> in those years, as we see the declining blue piece of the graph, we have been offering raises to our teachers, and I think tonight we're going to also be considering raises. Mm -hmm. So it's not like our costs are are, are flat across the board. We can, every year you give a raise, you give another, that same amount is in next year's budget, so it accumulates. And this is a dangerous trend that we're in, and um, I think that's why we've been talking about transparency and trying to alert our community to the situation because um, we have a fund balance now and we may be a little bit ahead of some other districts because of that but that's not going to last and I think we talked about in March the um, diminishing fund balance that we will be using so I agree with what you said David we've got to alert our um, community so that they can elect people who will fix school finance I wanted to add just one thing and to ask you a question, Randy. Um, you showed in the last meeting the, uh, what would the uh, deficit or the cumulative deficit look like uh, in, uh, for the 2021-2022 school year. And it was uh, about $96 million. So we're going to accumulate $96 million of deficit if we continue on this track. Um, that's assuming that property values keep on going 8%, assessed values. Now, I know that everybody here would like to see that level off. What happens if it levels off, if it goes from 8% to zero? What happens to the $96 million cumulative deficit? Yeah, so in one year, if, if, if that happened in one from one fiscal year to the next, it would went from <clears throat> Let's just say in 18, from 17, 18 to 18, 19, we grew 8%. And from 18, 19 to 19, 20, we didn't, we didn't grow at all. It just, it didn't decline. It just went flat. Then uh, our, our second year of that, our 19, 20 would be about $40 million less in revenue than the prior year. So we're going to be at uh, just about $136 million of cumulative deficit until school year 2021, 2022. This is going to be the time, even with 96, where we're going to have to start taking loans to pay salaries. So That's I right. think that, I, I'm not sure that everybody understands that, that uh, we're, we're in such great shape, but in three years down the road, we're gonna take loans to make salary, to make payday. That's correct, and it wouldn't be at that point because we had a negative fund balance, it would be because we're a property wealthy district that brings in taxes and gets very little state aid in our fiscal year ends June 30 and so we have to cash flow until December when our right. property tax revenues start coming in. But, but that trend will continue even beyond 2021, 22 if we until stay something on this. Changes. So that, that's important to understand that it's not just the deficit that we're going to look at for this year, it's the cumulative deficit that in 2021, 2022 is going to be out of hand. And if, uh, you know, hard to say, God forbid, property values stop increasing, which we all want, we have another $40 million here to fund. Thank you. I'm almost always amused when I hear the radio commercials about politicians wanting to cut property tax and fully fund education. It's like this shows that they're not doing that. So they could certainly start cutting the third of the tax they're taking from us. That'd be a starting place. <laughs> Very good point. Any other comments, questions? No, we're happy now. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. <laughs> Do I have a motion to authorize the advertisement of the notice of public meeting to discuss budget and tax rate? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. All right, item 8B. We're going to just all pass that around the table. Everybody gets to do that once. Seriously. Dr. Beth Brockman will introduce the discussion of the approval of the employee compensation, a compensation package for 2018 and 19. Dr. Brockman. Thank you. 
Uh, as you have before you and we have discussed in previous uh, board work sessions over the last couple of months, we are proposing a 2% general pay increase. This is done at the control rate across the board and you can see the changes it would make for teachers and are increasing our starting salary to 53,000 for teachers with a bachelor's degree with no experience and to 55,000 for teachers with a master's degree yet no teaching experience. All other employees were also uh, recommending a 2% general pay increase at the control rate. The figures that you see include um, not only the 2% pay increase, but a couple of adjustments that we made that we shared with you from the TASB consultant earlier this spring, uh, specifically regarding compensation for bus drivers in order to uh, be competitive and be able to hire bus drivers. Um, a, a, and a couple other uh, adjustments for small groups of employees that needed to be brought into uh, a competitive range uh, with our local market, as well as a few adjustments in this position, that position, this position, et cetera, across the board. Additionally, for your consideration, but um, it, it's not a, an ask for approval this evening, it's just a reminder on what our district contribution is for health insurance for our employees at $279 a month. And then additionally for your uh, consideration is the one-time $500 payment in December for eligible employees. That's all part of what I consider the complete compensation package for employees. Do I have a motion to approve the 2018-19 employee compensation package? I move that we approve the 2018-2019 compensation package. Second. Any second? Do I have second. A second. Any discussion? I, I just want to. I want to make one comment on this. Not that I don't think we should do this, but I do want to point out. Randy just said inflation is two and a half percent. This board has a history. We fought long and hard to get our salaries in a competitive position so that we could retain the best people possible for this district. And, you know, we just had a, every one of us talked about the struggles of the district and the, the budget process that we have. A 2% increase is not keeping up with inflation. This is helping our employees basically stay static. Um, I'm happy that we're doing this. I wish that we could do more, but I'm happy that we were able to do this and remain competitive. Any further discussion? Well, I do have a um, a uh, text, teacher salaries in America niche blob, and it says that starting salaries in uh, Texas starts at forty thousand seven hundred twenty-five. So I think that Plano ISD is very competitive. I believe that we are working very hard to keep the salaries up. So thank you, Beth, for doing a good job. Further discussion? All right, let's vote. All in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Item 8C, uh, we will discuss our legislative priorities. Carla Oliver will introduce discussion of the legislative priorities. Ms. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Stolle. The board declared a legislative subcommittee consisting of our current officers, which were Missy Bender, David Stolle, and Nancy Humphrey. They've come together a couple of times, including some work on their own behalf, and then certainly with the backup uh, of myself and Randy McDowell to do some research and to help support the ideas of the subcommittee on behalf of the entire board. So in your, in your study materials, you have a draft, um, and draft only because it's really up for your consideration when you're ready to pass those, but it's, a, it, it's growing to be a, um, a finalized document, I would say. Um, for the sake of our audience, I would, I'd like to just highlight the areas that we're, we've really focused the most attention on so for the 86th regular session, priorities might include Texas State Share of Funding for K-12 Public Education as a heading, and a number of points there that you may want to discuss at the table. Uh, also property tax relief. And I would say that there's special attention in the property tax 
property tax relief of our uh, tax parency message and all of the boards have been very active in, in pressing that message forward. Some, some have taken it up as a cause with your own time and with many people that you have access to that you might not otherwise have. So thank you for that. I will say one of the contributions that I made of just research, contribution is a big word, but um, I did want to let all of you know, uh, for those not on the subcommittee, that we are considering with the board's decision whether or not we would want to combine with Davis Advocates that currently works with our Chamber of Commerce and on behalf of some other entities to maybe um, um, mingle some of our needs together as they're working on a number of activities including a scorecard and I've spoken with them they're very excited about the possibility of combining some work and getting some synergy among each of those activities because we have so many things in common and very aware and and just fine with the fact that maybe some of our priorities might not line up but for those that do we could we could add some um, I would say some um, strength into our arguments so for that I'd like to share that that's all that I have to offer I know it's really more of a board topic so I'll leave it to you thank you miss Oliver now, do I have a motion to approve the legislative priorities so moved is there a second a second any discussion well, you know where I stand on 1E, and uh, instead of having a long discussion, can we do the same thing we did last year, uh, separate the vote, uh, vote on 1E separately so I can vote in favor of all the rest? And I would agree with Yorm too, because I don't oppose uh, vouchers for special education. I believe that since for special education that, you know, they some some students would need those vouchers to go to a private entity that will conserve them. So, I mean, I would agree with you on to separate E2. I'm fine with se separating it. Okay. Yeah, me too. So, uh, why don't we entertain a motion to approve items 1A, B, C, D, and items 2A, Romanets one and two, B and C. Is there a motion? Do you want to amend your motion? Yes, I'll amend my motion in the way that uh, Vice President Stolle has just articulated. I second. Okay. All in favor of the amended motion? Okay, that passes. Now let's, uh, I'll entertain a motion on item 1E. I move to approve item 1E, privatization of public education. We oppose any use of public funds for vouchers, tax credits, education savings grants, portability measures, or any other transfer mechanisms to private public e privatize public education. I second that motion. Okay, any further discussion on this, this item? I will just clarify uh, for the audience why I'm objecting to this. Um, I think that the reasons uh, that we have to object to this is because we don't want to have taxpayer money, public funds going to uh, schools that do not have to meet the same uh, accountability and uh, transparency requirements that we're subject to. So the only, uh, where I differ, I, I agree with that, where I differ is my position would be allow having vouchers, uh, education spending accounts, or in, under an, any other name, as long as they're given to schools that are held to the same standards of accountability and uh, transparency see and and I, I mean you know you and i disagree on this topic um but it, you know i've done a lot of research on this over the last year and the research is showing that these voucher programs just don't work that they don't provide um any kind of boost they don't provide any kind of economic efficiencies um the, if, if until there's research that says that these things are working. And, and you know, I can recall sitting my very first year on the board with um, a representative who was, who was vouching for the Florida plan. The Florida plan was gonna be great. We need to incorporate the Florida plan. The Florida plan is a disaster mm -hmm. and they're not getting results. And so I, I think it's more than just, just, you know, what the accountability measures are. I think that there's a real question as to whether these things even work in the first place so any further it, it just uh, my my concern is um, 
this is coming up in legislative sessions one after the other and uh, my guess is that if it's not going to happen in 2019 it might happen in 2021 in our position uh, our very strong position we object to this period we don't want to have the conversation just puts us on the other side it doesn't give us a seat at the table I'd like to have a seat at the table and share here are our concerns here are the problems with the way it's proposed, whether it's Florida, Nevada, or any other uh, state that has implemented this. Here are our concerns, here are the consequences. Let's find a way to address those consequences and address the needs of parents that would like to take uh, their kids, whether special education or not, uh, to other schools. So I just don't want to miss the opportunity to be sitting at the table and uh, have a very uh, strong uh, opposition. I believe we actually have a seat at the table, and I also have done a lot of research in this, and I've seen that um, the schools that you're discussing funneling money to, there's no um, proof that they are successful with the students any more than the public education schools are. And to take money away from a system that's currently pretty darn good, I think in Texas we graduate 89% of our high school students. And um, we, we have a very large population of non-English speaking students in the state of Texas. And we're doing that with a lot of challenges. So when you start chipping money away from a system that's working, I, I don't see the purpose for it. And I feel like there's um, perhaps a motivation of greed from people who are trying to operate private education. And they're infiltrating into the um, legislative system and I think it's you've got to question the motive behind it but I think we do a very good job here in Plano we absolutely do an excellent job here in Plano we saw the statistics on the screen rolling earlier mm -hmm. so um, we definitely have a seat at the table the uh, by the way uh, to, to even extend this uh, I think that some of the charter schools that are currently using public funds uh, may not be held to the same standards I, I would uh, I would even support increasing scrutiny to uh, how they're using funds. Uh, it just, I would rather focus on, um, and then I'll shut up, I'll shut up after this. I would rather focus on, um, let's make sure that they understand before they just pass it uh, unilaterally, which almost happened in the last legislative session. Let's make sure, make sure that they do understand what the consequences are, what the concerns are, and whatever plan they want to come up with it's going to be something that addresses them. And we've been doing that for all the years I've been on this board. Okay, any, any further discussion? Okay, uh, all, the, the motion was to approve item 1E, all in favor? All opposed? Motion passes 3-2. Wait, Nancy still held her hand up for a long time. <clears throat> okay, so we are now going to move to the reports uh, agenda section of our agenda. Our first report is uh, a report uh, by Dr. Katrina Hasley, and she will introduce the Special Education Board Advisory Committee report. Dr. Hasley. Thank you, Mr. Stalling. Yes, Sandy Knight is our Assistant Director of Special Education, and she has done a wonderful job this year of facilitating the work of the Special Ed Advisory Board Advisory Committee. And so she will bring a report now on the work that committee has completed for 2017-18. Sandy. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Stolle and Superintendent Bonzer, our trustees and our cabinet for allowing me to speak with you and share with you the research that our committee did this year. Um, all right, the goal that was presented to our committee this year was to research outstanding adult transition programs and recommend a plan of action to develop growing opportunities for the new adult transition center. These are the members who served on the committee this year. I want to thank them for their dedication to researching our goal. We have a couple of committee members I know that are here and thank you very much. Um, 
As we began our work, our committee members wanted to know more about the current program that we have in place at our three senior highs and at, and at our Collin College locations. We also reviewed the requirements in the law for transition. We visited the new building so that everyone had a visual representation of the layout of the building. We then began our researching of other programs which have reputations of having outstanding transition programs from across the country. And once we completed our research, we also studied the research of Dr. Vicki Mitchell, who is the co-director of the Garrett Center on Transition Services and uh, Disability Services at Sam Houston State University, and their publication of Quality Indicators for 18 Plus Services. We met uh, these four times in particular. Uh, during the October 23rd meeting, we shared with the committee the current program already in existence with Plano and our reasons for consol consolidating the programs into this one location. We also assigned uh, specific programs for research to the committee members. And then during our December 4th and February 12th meetings, the committee members shared their findings with the uh, rest of the committee. And then at our March 26th committee meeting, we reviewed the research that one, one more time and then we, made cons we consolidated the research so that we could make our recommendations to, uh, for Plano's program. As I mentioned, we have to throw in a picture of our new building that we're excited about at 1631 Dorchester Drive, which we visited in January. The committee members uh, researched certain programs that were recommended to us as being outstanding. We, uh, Region 10 gave us names of programs, transition specialists that we have uh, come to know through conferences and conventions, recommended programs and um, these are the people who took specific programs and researched them, our committee members. Our district's transition specialists, Deanna Tatum and Emily Vadner, created a list of questions for our committee members to use as we spoke to each of these uh, programs so that we were asking the same questions and were gathering the same information. And then each member was divided, uh, was provided the set of the questions and then reported their findings to the committee. I really think the research that was done this year is, is very beneficial to our program. So as a reminder, the, to qualify for a placement in an 18 plus program, the student is required to have completed all their state, district course and credit requirements for a diploma. But the art committee has determined that student needs additional services either for job placement job skill development or agency access. So from the research, the committee learned that there were the three main components for a successful adult transition program. The recommendations to follow in the presentation will fall into these three categories. So we have vocational training and employment planning, functional and independent living skills, and then family, community, and agency connections. It was affirming through our research to find that our program already has most of the elements we found in place, but what we did discover that some of the components were not always carried out consistently and uniformly because we were in four different locations. So this confirms one of the reasons we are so pleased that we're able to consolidate our program so we can ensure the fidelity of these opportunities for our students. The first category uh, is vocational training and employment planning. For the first time, the instruction is not going to be based on state standards. All instruction is driven by the goals of the individual students. Transition assessments will be given to students to assist with the placement. We need to design the learning based upon the student's strengths, upon their interests. The student's schedules may vary from day to day and they're driven by the goals that are developed in the IEP. The student schedules are gonna be flexible, meaning that they are, again, designed to meet each individual student's needs. Some students may come to the campus every day. Some students may come in the morning and they may work in the afternoon. Some students may come two days a week to the campus and three days a week be on a job site. 
Our research showed that for students who may not be able to work out in the community, we needed to establish volunteer opportunities for them within the campus. We thought about maybe co uh, collecting packets for the district, for other businesses, uh, collating packets. And our research found that several of the successful adult student programs across the country recommended that the environment look more like a business than a school. And um, both in looks and in vocabulary. So we are going to use a different vocabulary rather than school terminology. Instead of words like students, maybe we'll call our students interns. Instead of teachers, we may be job coaches. Um, there, this stood out to the committee as something really important, that this is to be a truly different program than what we were able to provide our students when they were on a senior high campus. However, it was recommended that this new campus will still follow the district school calendar. We'll work with our students, however, to help them understand that in not all jobs do you have two weeks off for winter break nor a week off in the spring. <laughs> so, Lastly, when out in the community, there needs to be a student, a staff to student ratio of about one to four. And this could be on a job site or this could be in a community-based instruction situation. Our second category of functional and independent living skills um, will involve building self-advocacy and self-determination skills in our students. All of these are gonna be embedded in everyday activities, whether in the community, on the campus, or on the job site. Functional academics are gonna include things like time management and money management for maths concepts, reading signs and words to learn directions, schedules, emails, expiration dates. Writing skills will improve the ability to develop resumes, to write emails, and to complete applications. Social skills will include workplace uh, behaviors, digital citizenship, critical thinking, and problem solving. And self-advocacy skills will be to be developed will include learning to ask for help when needed, working to improve life through eating properly, through exercise, along with learning to navigate the public transportation system. And progress is going to be documented through the use of task analysis and rubrics. Progress will still be documented and monitored, just in a different way than when they were on the high school campus. No more paper and pencil tests. That's not what we do in adult life, typically. It will be more through observation in real life settings. For example, like in the workplace, a finished product determines uh, your growth and your success. The third category is family, community, and agency connections. We know that su sustainability for what we put in place will depend upon the family involvement. This process will begin by holding open houses at the new uh, campus at before, right before school starts so that families, students can come, tour the building, find their classroom, meet their staff members. So it's not all brand new on the first day of school. We also learned that strong partnerships with the community and outside agencies are crucial. We are fortunate to have members on our committee who work in the business world here in Plano every day and that they're able to bring awareness of the abilities and gifts that our students can bring to the work site. And the committee recommended also that we have formal tours during the school year for local businesses to come in, see what our students can do, and uh, to give them a better understanding of the strength of our students and the contributions that they can make to our community. So these recommendations will be shared with the special ed department leaders. It will also be shared with the new adult transition center director along with the staff of this center. These recommendations will help to guide the consolidation of our program into one camp, new campus and the research of this committee again has been very beneficial to the district I feel. All right. 
Uh, we, it was requested that we possibly, uh, that we make possible suggestions for our goal, for this committee's goal for next year. And we have come up with explore ways to increase communication and involve, involvement opportunities for families of students with special needs. We know this goal can be multifaceted. It could be explore ways to help parents to become more of a part of the collaborative process of, with, of developing their students' IEPs. It could also be that there are many families who would benefit from support groups for those who have similar challenges. We could continue to focus on the adult transition program and recommend ways to support these families. We could also have an opportunity, this would op uh, be an opportunity to determine if there is a need for learning in general about special ed topics. So we just felt this was a very general way to say there's lots of things we can do. All right. Again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you the findings of our board advisory committee. And um, I was wondering if you have any questions. I actually have a comment. Okay. okay. There has been a need to develop an adult transition program of this scale. And uh, I'm really happy that our district has the ability to service uh, the students in special education that need transition services um, from high school to their new roles as adults in our community. So I praise the special education department for recognizing the need, this need, and adapting to the growing changes of our student population. So your research was well done. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So go ahead, Nancy. Oh, okay. I have Another one question. question. Yes. I noticed in um, the materials, and it may be in the next report, the CTE, okay. but I noticed we have about 45% of the students that are participating in these programs are um, participating in jobs that relate around food service. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to utilize the kitchen that currently exists in the uh, building? <laughs> Um, I think the kitchen in the facility may not meet all of the health code regulations, but 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 we're working on that, okay. and we are planning on um, our bigger bigger goal. Maybe that we want our students to work outside of food, so more of our students to work outside of the food industry. But we we we're thinking about catering. Right. Um, maybe we'll cater for a board meeting. Um, all sorts of things we have available to us. All right, thank you. It's just an unknown at this point. Okay. So I just have one one brief comment, I guess, and that is that, um, and for anybody who's on our other committees, I love your committee too. I really love this committee. You guys do uh, a you. phenomenal job, and thank what you. what we envision with the committee work um, is what you have done now, two years in a row, and so we're about to see. The next presentation, which is kind of uh, the, the the next step from last year's work, and then this year's work with uh, specific goals and specific action items to take now to implement is precisely what we asked yeah. the committees to do. And so, um, again, I love all of our committees, but <laughs> fantastic work, and I appreciate all of the hard work. So. Before you go, before you step away, I know there are some other committee members in the audience. If you all, if y'all could stand and let us recognize you for your work, those of you that are on this committee. Dylan, Dylan. Bethany. <laughs> the shy gentleman who won't stand. Is this awesome. this <laughs> work has a real impact on lives. What y'all are doing. Thank so you very this much. Is we are so excited. I'm, we're excited to give you the next report. Uh, in a few minutes. Okay, speaking of the next report, <laughs> Dr. Katrina Hasley will introduce the Career Technical Education Advisory Committee report. Dr. Hasley. Thank you, Mr. Stolle. As you know, David Hitt is our uh, CTE director, and he always does a really great job of leading, leading this committee. And so he will bring the report for the 2017-18 goals and suggestions for the fo following year's goals. David, I love your, your committee too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hasley. <clears throat> Vice President, or good evening, Vice President Stolle, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Bonzer. Uh, in an effort to keep the sharing of our information with you tonight as efficient as possible due to this year's goals, uh, we decided to share it in a report format. 
and uh, you know to accompany the and supplement the presentation tonight and maybe give you a little bit more details so we'll be referring to that uh, uh, as we talk uh, we'll have a, a nice uh, segue from some of the work that Chan Sandy just shared with you from their committee uh, as we have a little a bit of an overlap but then I think a, a little bit broader perspective on, on some of the things uh, in our first goal so just to review the the board directed goals um, for this year uh, goal one was to explore the opportunities to provide appropriate career pathways and opportunities to support the students with disabilities and then our second goal was to identify the opportunities and best practices for teaching coding uh, in grades K through 12. In researching and gathering the information on goal one, uh, the advisory committee members were pleased to find out the extent to which the district is already doing a great job regarding providing these opportunities for our students with disabilities. And that'll even get stronger with the ATC, as Sandy mentioned. As you'll see in the report, uh, this success is largely due to the efforts and programs that the district special education department provides from the transition committee work and the planning to the job coaching, she mentioned the school to work uh, program and then project search. Much is done uh, to provide um, you know, career training and experiences for these students. And for some perspective with numbers, uh, currently at our three senior highs, there are 107 students with disabilities in the school to work program specifically. I know you'll be hearing, uh, well, I know you've just heard more detail about the new adult transition center. Um, but I believe combining the students from Collin College and the three senior highs, about 113 students uh, are expected to receive services at that location next year. In addition, um, and in many instances in collaboration with the special education department and services, the students have opportunities to complete three CTE pathways of courses. As you will note in the report, uh, these include traditional CTE courses within the general ed class setting, career preparation, also in a general ed classroom, as well as special education career preparation course uh, that is specifically designed for students who need additional support in the job training. Currently there are 302 students at our ninth and 10th grade campuses served by special education and enrolled in CTE courses and a 640 at our senior highs. In addition, there are 10 at the Academy High School. So we look to the section on community support. It's important that job internships uh, provide a ladder of opportunity for advancement and growth when possible. And here are several pathways um, successful in the past and frequently used to provide career learning that are for our students with disabilities. Um, those include public service area like vet offices, healthcare, teaching, and community service. This is approximately 10% of our students with disabilities are in the, that career area. Uh, hospitality and food services, which uh, Nancy was mentioning, uh, busing tables, cleaning, etc., about 45%. And then in business services, stocking, grocery, big box, uh, greeters, laundry, 40%. Uh, and then in distribution and logistics, uh, things like stocking, loading, supplies, packing, assembly, et cetera, about 5%. We have uh, business partners working with each senior high, and we are always seeking additional locations. There are a number of great resources already in place that I will be showing next. Um, they were created by one of our excellent CTE teachers, Tommy Gines, who's with us tonight. Uh, Tommy, on the row back there. He's on staff at Plano East. He, t he teaches career preparation and supervises over 100 students, including students with disabilities in their job and school to work sites. Tommy's a unique teacher with both special ed certification and CTE certification. And so um, I've listed, um, you know a few of those resources we'll take a quick look at, at some of those things that he has had in place and then some he's developed already as even though we're identifying and, and, and sharing with you existing opportunities he's already put in motion some action and some things that can help uh, going forward 
of the ability of the CTE and special ed teachers to coordinate and share employment sites and the uh, community support opportunities have potential to benefit numerous students um, at varying instructional levels. So you'll find these resources listed in your report handout. Um, one that I will uh, bring up, Let's see if I have that particular one linked right here. We won't be able to necessarily read the details, but you just get an idea. These are examples, sample job work sites. You'll see familiar businesses and uh, Again, board members, if it's easier for you to read from your report, but for everyone else, um, you can see some of our good partners that have been in place and some of the type of, of uh, different job positions and such that they've been able to uh, provide our students. And then if we take a look also, this is uh, one of the resources that I mentioned that Mr. Gines has built. Uh, if we if we back it up to, I don't know if I put on my glasses, that would help. <laughs> Let's see. If we actually hit the entry point for this, this is a blog that Mr. Gines had set up uh, probably uh, years ago. Um, okay, to uh, help because there was just absolute a need to help connect the businesses who had jobs mm -hmm. with students that needed them and could get some experiences and, and some things like that. And so uh, he took it on himself, the initiative to do this. And so you can see that uh, this is in place and students and teachers across the district can go here to help find these. So it's a great resource that's already in place. What he's added recently as we've, as a member of the committee and then in general, he's added a, a simpler way for businesses to take this link and it will take them straight to a place where they could submit a job posting. It's got the contact information there and if you click this link here, it's going to take you straight to a Google form where they can fill out the information simply and it will automatically post, right Tommy, to the So that's a great step in a, in, a, in a direction to help improve and grow these opportunities that we're talking about. And then uh, finally, he's also already created a resource to help with the ATC specifically. And so, uh, like I told you before, he kind of works a dual with a dual hat and very closely collaborates with the special ed department and such. And so as they implement, Here's a form for them to use uh, to gain, uh, you know, more business uh, partnerships and opportunities as well. So I wanted to share those with you just to, to show uh, some efforts have already taken place towards solutions and not just identification. So the uh, committee um, formed these recommendations. Uh, to continue collaboration with the district special ed department staff to support and provide the opportunities for students. This is really important and powerful as it combines the resources that both CTE and special ed can provide. Uh, continue development and expansion of the job opportunities for students with disabilities through the CTE career preparation course. The work study program uh, to increase awareness and improve means of sharing the existing Plano jobs blog information maybe via the school website, social media, the district uh, communications methods. Seek additional local business partners through networking, promotion, and education to support this initiative. And, and be prepared to explain how. Uh, that's what Tommy shares with me is, is so much of his uh, bulldog persistence when he gets a contact and he keeps at it. And it gets them to understand what kinds of jobs they may not even realize they have that would work for some of these students. Some of these students can do incredibly efficient and, and quality work doing something that the, a person that maybe doesn't have a disability couldn't do for longer than 10 minutes, but just, just because of the nature of their, uh, you know, their skills and such. So 
uh, that's something that he shares is always important. Uh, promoting uh, that link to the PlanoHighSchoolJobs.com uh, on maybe the counselor pages at the senior highs and high schools and on the CTE website and at the top of the site the following two links that we already shared. And then uh, collaborating with the district communications department to help develop some media materials to help educate and promote those opportunities because we always know that, you know a little two minute video can say a lot when you put it together and put a lot of time into it uh, to make it clear what's, what do we need, uh, what can you help us with. Um, we saw the Google form already and other examples would be like maybe like an article or feature story in the e-news or district digest um, including information even about the ATC uh, in our local news media star courier plano profile etc and then another possibility would be to create a parent newsletter uh, in support of the ATC and the school to work program at the three senior highs and then finally um, providing CTE teachers inclusive of our career preparation teachers with uh, professional development for providing and growing successful work study opportunities district wide. Um, employer recognition was an idea that some of the committee members had, uh, you know, doing something to, to recognize and, and shout out our businesses that are being great partners so that others will want to do that as well. And that can always be effective. So I thought that was a great idea. And then, like uh, you saw with uh, Sandy's presentation, uh, next steps will be to take this information that the committee has researched and come up with, and we'll be sharing these recommendations with the special education department leaders, the new adult transition director, uh, for consideration in their programming decisions going forward. So, David, Dave, before, uh, go, go ahead, Nancy. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, jump in. I, I couldn't see you. Yeah. Uh, before you move on to the coding, um, well, I, I know that our communications department is fabulous and they'll be able to put together a really awesome video for you but have we considered we're partners the district is a partner with the chamber of commerce we're members of that have we reached out to the chamber to let them let them know about us right i'll defer to either tommy or sandy if you want to speak to that have spoken with the chamber about the new adult transition center oh, and good. so as we get closer to the opening and and the things that we might do with businesses they are aware of that opening and so um, I'll continue also okay. as I work with them to Thanks. keep the connection so uh, I would I would really like to find a way to um, I mean advertise I don't know it's probably the wrong word but promote these businesses that are partnering with us and I would encourage people to take a look at the, the list of jobs in here if you have the opportunity and the, the stores that are there and go to these stores support those stores that support us um, but one of these jobs stood out to me and it's highlighted in blue fortunately mm -hmm. musician I mean how cool is that yeah, that we have placed that. a student to be a musician at a, at a restaurant so to take advantage of that student's particular skill uh, found something that marries perfectly in the community that that student may love maybe that's what their love is their passion and so um, you know for us we need to support those folks those, those businesses that are supporting us absolutely very good all right we'll move into the coding uh, gold topic I want to start with just a short little video overview that we felt would provide sort of a good starting point for this so we'll Take that first if it pops up there, good. A lot of the world's problems today really need people to collaborate together and try to solve the, the most pressing problems with technology. Coding is the new literacy, coding is the new writing. And we need to start with this literacy from a very, very young age. Globaloria is the first of its kind for project-based learning of computer science, game design, and coding. The students, they are registered to a course where every day they work for an hour, an hour and a half designing games. And we teach them how to come up with an idea, do research, create a design document, prototype their game. They are on a network. It's like a Facebook for social construction of knowledge. Every step of the way, they document 
what they're working on, how they're working on it, and where they are in the process so they can receive feedback from the teachers and the peers in their classroom. They learn through design, but they also explain something through their games and through their designs. There is nothing more powerful than learning by teaching or learning by explaining. Global areas uh, change our students. They are excited. Students learn processing, they learn planning. My kids have learned how to be critical thinkers and how to be patient. They have to do their own research on the topic. They actually have to be proficient with the topic before they can start planning their game. Before I got to Global Oriad, I didn't even really know how to use a computer, and now I'm learning coding. I use it in making a Spanish game, which uh, forces me to be able to think about how I can teach others. My game was about a ninja who was avoiding an apocalypse, and he would have to collect the math questions to make the barrier that's around the exit disappear. It makes me feel really good and really proud of myself. It makes me feel powerful for the sole reason that I'm the one making the game. I decide what I can teach. It's a career I would like to pursue. This is what I believe I can do, and this is what I'm, I want to do for my future. So I thought that would kind of set the tone and, and give a little bit of clarity of what coding, uh, you know, in our current lingo is computer science, computer programming, but it's just kind of branched into this entire, you know, there's so many things that involve coding at some level. Uh, and so I, it's not really an endorsement of this particular resource. However, that, that particular company is in the top five uh, nationally of some of the tools uh, that are used, but I just felt they did a good job of just kind of characterizing what we're talking about. Um, let's take a look at our existing coding opportunities um, and so um, let me go back to the presentation here. And again, these are, are listed in the report. But for those of you that are looking at the screens, again, uh, can't quite see all of it, but you can get an idea. In the shaded areas there, um, the, the uh, blue shaded areas are gonna be curriculum, uh, you know, structured curriculum opportunities, whereas the green is going to be more of the co-curricular and extracurricular uh, opportunities that our kids have. And so look, you can look through that list. And I want to take a second and, and thank um, you know all the various curriculum department leaders and the specialists that helped build that list because uh, it's just a testament to how coding is pervasive in that you know we have some coding in CTE classes. We have coding in our math department classes and certainly the computer science classes that are part of that department, support, et cetera, <coughs> science, uh, robotics, uh, the PACE program. There are a number of those that you can see listed there in detail. What would stand out to you um, is that, um, well, and before I say the next one, as you may know, the district has made some recent strides and support toward expanding the opportunities uh, through the addition of a dedicated computer science position, uh, a computer science specialist position, and then uh, the math department's success and you all's approval to bring forward um, new courses, uh, approval of new courses. We have computer science choices now down at the ninth and 10th grade level this year for the first time ever in Plano. And so that is a, definitely a step in the right direction uh, and, and really excited for that. And then I would also uh, want to say some praise towards uh, Amy Bates and then, you know, the campus robotics groups, their continued growth and the expansion of those experiences because they definitely, there's essential needs for coding as they program their robots to do the game for that particular season, et cetera. And all those, although those aren't always structured activities in a curriculum or a course. Some, in some of our engineering courses in CTE, we do have that, and in some, but uh, especially in these extracurricular, the robotics clubs and organizations and such. David, I'd like to just do a, um, a plea, a request. As we look at the robotics, huge fan, but we're at this point still inconsistent in terms of the offerings that, that children get. Uh, I think we have a plan to expand robotics for next year, but we still will have six middle schools that won't have the first tech challenge. 
that's the more sophisticated challenge. And so to have it at some middle schools but not others, for example, if you live in the West Cluster, you have to go to Rice Middle School in order to get that particular opportunity. You can't get it at Renner, you can't get it at Frankfurt. And so we have six schools like that that I don't know when they're on the list. And so I think that's, that's an important distinction. I want all children because at the middle schools that don't have it, they still do First Lego League, which is the same challenge that the elementary kids get. And so you're a middle schooler and you're doing the same program that an elementary school child is doing. So we need to look hard at implementing that. I also have a, um, a concern about the FIRST Robotics. That's only available right now at the Academy High School and at Plano, Se Plano Senior High School. Um, that program is incredible. They take over the Georgia Dome. They have marching <laughs> bands. I mean, it is the Super Bowl of robotics. It is incredible. I could see having it at just the Academy High School because those children are already making trade-offs to go to that program. But to have it at Plano Senior and not to have it at East or West is like having football at Plano Senior and not having it at East or West. Or to have band or to have drill team. And so I know we've had discussions about trying to find the right teacher leader uh, at those two schools, but I'm sure there must be two educators in North Texas that want to work for Plano ISD that are good CTE or math or physics teachers or computer science teachers who would be willing to be the sponsors. So I, just as a plea to the administration, to my fellow board members, we need to be really conscious of that particular inequity that, that we have right now. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, Tammy, to add to your point, um, I'd like to see more blue, you know, when you look in the mm -hmm. list of the courses, their yeah. curricular, uh, because I, I, as you showed the video at the beginning, the, the wonderful presenter was talking about how this is the language of the future and more kids need this. I was at a symposium this weekend and I happened to step into a breakout session about information technology and I was listening to employers and they're saying that everyone, no matter who it is, whatever your major is, you need to have some IT background. So if we can offer this to the kids for curricular work, I think we're in a better position and they will be too. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more and I think certainly we have it as part of the curriculum and pace in elementary, but to be thoughtful about how we can have that as a curricular offering because when women and when folks of color start this early, they have a chance for an incredible career, lucrative careers, careers that do interesting and important work. And so we need to do all that we can to encourage inclusion in the future. Absolutely. You guys just about covered my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, on best practices and kind of, so we just saw kind of our existing opportunities and we heard some great ideas for some, to expand that. Um, when we talk about best practices, uh, it was interesting for the committee to find out that uh, a few years back, uh, there was a group that did, uh, it's actually the Association of Computer Machinery, Code.org, Computer Science Teachers Association, the Cyber Innovation Center, and the National Math and Science Initiative. They collaborated with state's district and the computer science education community to develop conceptual guidelines and standards for computer science education. So those are available for our leaders to look at and to, to take. You've got, again, some information on that in your uh, report. And then they also have a framework that will take it right down to the grade bands uh, if we just take real quick and look at like a jump to grades three through five, it's spelled out those standards by the end of grade five. These are the type of things that would nationally have been studied and, and would be good standards or benchmarks uh, when those structured programs get more embedded in the curriculum and in more opportunities wider. Uh, and then, so best practice again, coding, as an integrated or an embedded skill is relatively new at the elementary grade levels. The current elementary grade level TEKS do not include structured lessons or activities for introducing learning and practicing coding yet, but we expect that they be addressed in the next TEKS revisions. There are like, and like you noticed, there are pretty good offerings. We're doing a pretty good job at the, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade, there's a few opportunities if they take their gateway program with Project Lead the Way but, or if they're in the clubs as an option. But there could be more there, especially to capture more females, more minority, et cetera. Uh, but 
at the high school level now we've got a pretty good pathway pretty strong offerings and choices but there's definitely some work to be done at the elementary and at the middle school level um, there are a few districts including uh, Beeville ISD that um, Mrs. Bonzer shared with me um, uh, early in the year that she went to a session and, and got some information uh, they were actually the first district in Texas to require computer science for students in all grade levels across the board. So I think they would be good to study, to go visit, if that's the choice of the, you know, the direction that the, uh, that Dr. Hasley and, and the board, you know, decide is our best uh, step forward. Um, and there, there are some coding initiatives going on nationally in a couple of other s uh, s school districts that are listed in their executive summaries that I provided you as well. Um, so recommendations that kind of echo uh, what we just saw uh, continue you know our improved promotion and education of the coding opportunities for the students uh, with teachers counselors campus administration learning media services a start would be creating maintaining and sharing a database of coding tools and resources um, some of our we've got some you know stars down in our elementary level that are one or two here across the district or so and then as some as our elementaries uh, implement the maker spaces the, there's definitely opportunities for coding and, uh, and chance you know uh, for kids to practice and learn more about coding and some of those activities as well um, but it's it's kind of hit or miss right now just the point that, that uh, Ms. Richards made um, choose coding curricular that's student-centered and follows a progressive sequence as well as a developmentally appropriate uh, and offers structured learning opportunities for students as they progress from grade to grade. Again, if those standards are followed, that would happen. Um, continue collaborating with curriculum leaders across all the relevant areas, K through 12. Uh, we certainly did that when we were gathering this information to begin with. Um, and then even include the core academic areas uh, when possible to support and grow coding activities and experiences. Uh, even even in those uh, it reminds me of 10 or 15 probably 20 years ago when English finally for their projects it used to just be PowerPoint or poster <laughs> and then you know then we went through that stage of where they could do some multimedia options or now they have videos and and so there's I see that now some coding projects could be in, integrated and such as, as an option there um, make an intentional effort to seek and invite guest presenters to share coding career information opportunities and application to the real world again it's something that uh, the general public doesn't always connect what's going on you know what, what's the coding part of that uh, and so just educating uh, kids about the opportunities and, and skills that they already have especially translating from video game experience and things like that that they don't realize they're already doing some of this. They just didn't know you could make a living out of it. <laughs> Campuses uh, should consider after school cutting clubs and host like hackathon type events and activities. That was definitely a, a recommendation from some of the members on the committee. And consider implementing summer coding camps. I say that, I don't want to create work for anyone that I'm not responsible for creating work, work for. But I can tell you again, uh, it reminds me of when we stood in front of you uh, 10, 11 years ago and we were starting Plano ISD's first structured engineering program. And shortly after the first couple of years, Project Lead the Way uh, ha uh, gave to us the materials we needed to start some summer engineering camps. And immediately we had like 50% girls and boys instead of the, over, the, you know, the offset that we see in the classroom at the higher levels in our engineering courses. And so that's, now in its seventh year and it continues to we have three different campuses every summer that offer three different weeks each uh, and so I, I see that being here we are at the same moment in time with coding so maybe that's something that could be looked at and and some coding camps uh, do we our, still do our summer program called, used to be called SIGS yes. so do we have any coding Special classes interest. as part of SIGS That'd be a good inclusion. And then finally, uh, collaborate with district communications again to develop media materials to help educate and promote coding opportunities for students and parents. And that certainly could include the robotics. Uh, it's 
it's visually very enticing and, and you know, so I, I feel like something spectacular could be done with that, you know, on the level of like Apple or Google's commercials or something. <laughs> David, just an observation on the recommendations. I, uh, my son at college level signed, changed major to computer science. And these coding, the hackathon events, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily a hackathon event, but it's an event where you are in a team and you're yeah. given a challenge and you've got to figure out what the, you know, I mean, I'm sure that's exactly what that hackathon event is. But mm -hmm. he said those are the most fun, mm -hmm. one, you develop the best relationships with people, two, and it really gets you excited about what you're doing. And yeah. so mm -hmm. that's why I would encourage you all to, really look at how can we incorporate more of those types of events I mean even if it's it's extracurricular in a sense of coming in on a Saturday or something and do it college level kids love that I'm sure that these other kids would too I was gonna say I bet you could include some um, students from UTD or Collin College to help lead that so we're not creating so much work we'd still supervise it but bring them in because they're probably going to be able to really relate with the kiddos yeah I, I think you know we, we, we talked before about partnering up with other local universities or whatever I think this is that's a great opportunity to partner up with universities here to help absolutely with that I know that Whitney and, and Lisa if Lisa was still here she would share that they, they're making some inroads with that now making some partnerships and some things because some of these companies HP etc will come in mm -hmm. and they'll sponsor it They'll, they'll front and support it at a campus. And so that's, I think, the excitement that you can generate. So Ms. Oliver and President Bender and I had a meeting last week with uh, a business that's relatively new in town. Um, I don't know if I want to call them by name yet. Uh, but their uh, wish was to find a way to link up with the district. Uh, and one of the very things that they want to support is coding robotics, hackathon events. Mm. Uh, connecting to students from PISD to UTD so you know we're, we're hopeful that we actually have a partner to help sponsor uh, that very type of event in the pipeline. That's exciting. Very good. I just think it's important once again to think about equity we have 44 elementary schools some have very strong PTAs and strong after-school programs others do not so a kid's opportunity shouldn't be dictated by their school. And then as before, uh, we'll be sharing these recommendations uh, with the academic service department leaders, the math and science coordinators at all the levels, and our computer science specialists that I mentioned earlier uh, for consideration uh, in expanding the K-12 uh, coding. And then to wrap things up, um, the, um, sorry, the next slide there. As far as some thought that was put in and some input, some ideas from our, our members of our committee, and et cetera, um, we thought that these two might be something for you to consider um, exploring ways to improve the process of informing the middle school students prior to their spring semester of eighth grade of opportunities and course selection and career pathways in CTE as you all know we have over 80 different courses spread amongst and so it's it's very challenging for our counselors they have so much information and to keep up and so it's it's uh, I think maybe that we could get some some good ideas and some creative ways to go at that to improve that uh, it's somewhat information overload but there's always a better way you know so I think we want to branch out and get more minds attacking that uh, is where that's coming from um, and, and again it's just from inconsistencies firsthand things that we hear from parents from students from teachers etc it's just uh, inconsistently the way things are, are communicated um, and then the second possible would be exploring opportunities to increase attainment of an associate's degree for the Health Sciences Academy. We, kn we know that's already a goal of the academy, but there's enough, uh, you know, we're getting the kids about two-thirds of the way there, and we had the first one last year that did do it. Um, uh, again, I think we're already making some strides because as we add math and some science opportunities, uh, for dual credit starting this next school year, then they're gonna be a little bit closer. And we talked about that uh, two weeks ago in our, in our report on the dual credit. Uh, but I think that some additional study could, could go into that on, uh, you know, almost kind of like a, an audit. Come in, tour, see, look at all the different things, and then again, just get more minds looking at that, see what can we, what can we do even more efficiently uh, if there's anything. And if there's not, there's not, but it'd be worth, I think, the effort 
to dig into that to see how much closer can we get so we have you know half of them with their associates you know at the end of the year and by the way thank thank those of you that were able to, to come to and uh, the, the pinning ceremony I thought it was really good yeah, and I, I appreciate the support so in closing uh, let me say thank you to the members of the CTE Advisory Committee um, and to Dr. Hasley for her support, as well as the board and the cabinet members for your support. Any other questions or comments? I really applaud the progress, the fact that we have good, deep computer science classes for all four years of high school. I think Absolutely. it's important for our students. And so they don't start out behind or they discover their passion earlier. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. I'd also, referencing your comments about so many pathways, the, the, the challenge for our counseling staff, we need to put more information on our website. We need to have counselor in a box on the website mm. because there's just too much to explain. Virtual I know, counselor. Exactly, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And also, don't ever make a kid go and pick up a form. In yeah. the, let, it, let them download something. <laughs> um, and so we just need to be more inclusive with that information because when our counselor to student ratios what's it 400 to 1 I mean there's there's just absolutely no way and so we need to put the best of our information online so kids and families can access it on their own time absolutely Thank put, you. put a hackathon event on that so they can <laughs> <laughs> upload there you go. they can put on the website yes. that's right <laughs> we can do it faster yes. <laughs> and David I want to say thank you for all that you do for the, for the school district and your department because you expanded our career and technical programs for all our students there are special ed students or kids and talented you know all the career you know CTE students thank you for all you do absolutely my pleasure all right, so, so David before we let you go let they, if you've got any committee members here we'd like to ask oh. them to stand so that they may be recognized absolutely. as well for their work yeah. any further questions thank you David uh -huh. thank you Okay, moving on now to item uh, 9C, the Adult Transition Center report. Dr. Katrina Hasley again will introduce the Adult Transition Center. Thank you, Mr. Stolle. This is one more report from my team. You've noticed that we're here talking about adult transitions, but we're excited tonight to introduce to you Debbie Wilkes of DR Wilkes Consulting. She is a statewide consultant specializing in the area of special education instruction, transition, and post-secondary education for uh, special needs students and adults. And she came highly recommended to us as an expert in the area of transition programs for students ages 18 to 22. So the special aid leadership team began working with Debbie in January as we were preparing to open the new adult transition center. So um, I've asked her to come and share a little bit about the work and the collaboration she's provided for our leadership team since January as we're transitioning to consolidating our program. And then after Debbie speaks, Sandy Knight will come back up to the podium to wrap up our um, presentation with next steps. Debbie. Thank you very much for having me tonight, and I'm really excited to be here with in Plano ISD. I'm a resident in Plano ISD, and I do now better understand why my taxes for the school keep going up, but that's all right. I am, um, I've been an educator since 1974, so I've been working in, in the area of special education, retired as director of <coughs> a Special Ed in Richardson School District. and. Also, one other reason I'm really <coughs> excited to be here is that um, after being working in this field for as many years as I have, at, um, in August, my uh, youngest granddaughter will be starting in PPCD here in uh, Plano ISD, and she's moving here from Kansas. And I'll tell you, we went and we really scrutinized every school district. And through my eyes, that was a tough thing. And um, we chose Plano because of the programming that you have to offer. So thank you very much. Um, I am, um, since I left working in the school district, I've really focused my attention much more on the adult population. I've been working, I'm on the board of directors for My Possibilities. I'm also on the board of directors for the Architexas. And um, I've created programming that um, through the University of North Texas that all Texas Workforce Commission vendors must take. So I have a lot of experience on the other side of transition. And um, the other thing that I'll talk a little bit later is I'm an associate with the Institute of Person-Centered Practices, 
which is a collaboration between the University of Texas and Texas A&M, and we always kind of go whoop as we uh, <laughs> talk about it. So we so we're kind of a very strange group of people that we work together. And I am a trainer for an international organization on person-centered planning. So I come with a lot of credentials working in the area of transition. And um, to me, it is probably when they introduced transition in the 80s, and I was on the first transition task force in Texas. To me, transition is a thing that makes the biggest difference in the lives of, the, of anybody. And all students participate in transition. That's, that's not a special ed concern that's everybody does it but the minute you have an IEP the transition looks so different and to me it made sense I'd been a life skills type of teacher and it was like what happens to those kids after they leave us what's going to happen and so to address that as an as um, as the next step it's really really important so um, um, so what I what I've done in um, the role is I've really helped to look at the an implementation plan of how are we going? I guess the building's bought. Yes, we've gotten furniture for the building. We've done all of those things, but now how are we going to be looking at that instruction? What is that? How is that instruction going to look different? So the first thing I did was I went and I talked to all the classroom teachers and all and all the high schools and the four high schools and. Um, also um, visit a little bit with Bethany Rogers to get an idea of what it looks like all the way from PPCD up. And so, because I wanted to know what was happening before you talk about any change. And so I wanted to build relationship with those teachers because anytime you're gonna implement change, change is based on relationship. You can't come in and tell people what to do. You need to build on what's already there. Um, and so we also did trainings for people and it's a lot of collaborative work sessions. Um, and um, one of the things I've been working on too is creating some rubrics that are data-driven rubrics that are really looking at what's life going to be like afterwards. And because of my work with the adult population, my mind is constantly on where are they going, not where they presently are. Um, and so I'm, I'm constantly saying, well, what does that look like later? How are what you, you're planning on doing going to transition? Because the school's going to disappear. So those are some of the things that I've been doing um, as I've worked through this. I've had, um, we started off with having um, meetings with the, um, with all the principals first. So we went over all the changes and helped them understand what we were looking at. How does the last day of public school look like the first day of the rest of your life? Then after that, we met with all those teachers and um, explained to them this concept of transition. And then from there, we knew our biggest stakeholders are the parents. Um, yes, the teachers are huge stakeholders. Yes, the principals are. But bottom line, the person that's going to be addressing transition is going to be the family member. Once, And it's a rude awakening. It's a really scary thing when all of a sudden that school bus isn't there. And so we had to have spend some time with the parents to help them understand and address their concerns. And they had a lot of concerns. I think one of the things that I had to offer to the parents, well, I know one of the things I had to offer to the parents is I do have a reputation in Plano ISD with the parents. And so there was a level of, oh yeah, she does know what, she, what it's about. Because it's one thing when teachers say, oh, the school bus is gonna be gone. But when somebody that's walking that walk sees it, it's quite different. So um, we had those parent meetings, and um, I asked Sandy to do a count for me, and we had 163 people attending, which I thought was a great number. And the other thing that was kind of what's good about it was they were not, a lot of the parents that came were not parents of kids that would be going to the, uh, to the adult transition center right away. We had parents of younger age kids because they were wanting to know about it. And what was also great was, each time we did a train, each time we had a parent meeting, we had new parent. We had more and more parents, and one father, one it was one father, I think, or it could have been the mother, came and she came came up to me afterwards. She said, "My husband was at the last one, and he told me I had to come." Mm -hmm. So it was great to get these parents that were the word was out, and so you know that it's that grapevine that gets the information as much as anything, especially in the areas with special education parents they have a network that's really strong. Um, and then the other thing that I, we did was we really worked on agency collaboration with LifePath, Texas Workforce, and LaunchAbility. Um, those are three agencies that I have a lot, of, a lot 
involvement with because um, obviously I'm on the board of my possibilities but Texas workforce I've created some of their training materials and so what we were looking at was how do we utilize those training materials how do we utilize the support that those agencies can give I know we're already doing some of you're doing some of it but let's expand on that let's really get the big biggest bang for your buck by helping other people pay for things because that's really what transition is. There's a memorandum of understanding that's a statewide memorandum. So if you know how to use it, you can, it, you know, you need to know it inside and out to be able to know how to use it. And those are some of the things that I bring based on my knowledge of working statewide. Um, did move on. There we go. And then the other thing I, that was really important is this person-centered transition assessment. We recognize that all instruction is based on assessment. You can, every piece of, everything you do is based on assessment. And so we really had to ramp up what does that assessment, that transition assessment look like. And so as an associate of the Institute of Person-Centered Practices, I was, I created a person-centered transition assessment that's being used statewide. As a matter of fact, I'm working with the, um, with the uh, transition task force for the state of Texas to get this rolled out statewide. But it's a way of really looking at the person first. So much of what we do in the school systems is that we're, we, have, we have a curriculum, a state curriculum that we need to follow. And so everything we're doing is based on that curriculum. Well, once the students have earned their academic credits, then you're not looking, it's not what we say needs to be taught to the individual. It's what the individual needs to meet the values of the family of what they're going to do after they leave school. It's not about us at all. It's really about what their values are. And it's then we need to say, how do we support their values? What instruction do we give to meet their values? So the person-centered transition assessment does exactly that. And it also helps families understand, I always tell the parents that they're doing a huge paradigm shift. When you talk about transition, it is the biggest paradigm shift. And so helping them understand that. By the time a person-centered assessment is done, there's a clear plan of action of what every person's going to do. So that's great, and I'm doing that with individuals. I, they, um, I did it, I, we offered it to everybody that was in Collin College, and then there were a few other parents that were, dis, were de, it was determined that they, were, that they would have an assessment. But that's not what the school district wants. The school district doesn't want somebody from the outside to come in and do your assessments. That doesn't make any sense. So what we've done is um, we've, been tr we've trained two of the staff right now, the two transition people, and they are in the process of becoming certified by the Institute of Person-Centered Practices so they can do the assessment. And so one of the things, you know, it's one of the ways to build the capacity within Plano ISD so that you're not dependent, you know, a good consultant is constantly working their way out of a job. And that's by building the capacity within the, within the district. So that's what I've been working with with this person-centered approach is to get a much better form of assessment so, our, so the instruction is meeting the transitional goals, not the goals that we have. But my question always is, what is that going to look like after they end services? What are you doing today that's going to continue the next day? The last day of school, you better be having the next first day of the rest of their life beginning because otherwise they end up sitting on the couch or waiting for these long wait lists to get services from somebody else. So, so do you assess as they complete their high school diploma or is the assessment when they age out, which is when they turn No, no, no. 22? The assessment can be done at different times and that's one of the things that the district will be addressing. Right now, all we were doing was the assessment for, this, for the students that were going to be going to the adult transition center. But by law, you're required to do a transition assessment by age, uh, you know, before you develop your I, the transition plan. So it's, they're done earlier. But this, is a, but this is a process that really zeroes in for the families to have a better understanding of what that looks like. And, it's, and it's, it's not a paper and pencil type of thing. It's really having a conversation with family members and the, and the individual with the disability. And several of the individuals that I did the plan with, they don't even use words to communicate, but we are still able to get the assessment. 
So Sandy, do you want to take over and talk about your next steps? So our next steps, uh, next step would be to select a director for our new program. We interviewed six people today. We're very excited. We think we met some outstanding individuals. Then uh, we're going to also, we're in the process of preparing the campus. I think we got the keys last week. And uh, we have, we're, steps are, are already in place to start the painting. There's slight slight renovation you know you do have to have a clinic when you have a campus that's not there now so a few things like that there has been a year-long collaborative process with so many departments and I'd like to express a sincere thank you to so many people right now our facilities department including construction and moving our human resources department our transportation department our finance department Technology Department, Safety and Security Department, Technology Department. I think I said that twice. I've really involved <laughs> them. <laughs> and, uh, and then our Fans Department. It's just been a collaborative effort. Uh, the teamwork has been amazing. Little did I know that when you're opening a new building as an educator, I didn't know you had to have a flagpole, you have to buy it, you have to erect it, you have to have more than a four foot picket fence around a yard where, where students will be, or interns, whatever we choose to call them. Um, you have to have trash cans for the outside, for the inside, for the cafeteria, for the classrooms. You have to have mats for the doors inside and out. It's just amazing. And all these departments have come together, and every time we meet, someone you know is able to point out something to me that's one more thing we need. Um, the list goes on and on. And then with uh, pending board approval, uh, we will have a summer academy for the staff July 23rd through the 25th to bring these teachers that are in, in four different locations together in a unified format to, to work together. Uh, we also uh, plan to build a strong instructional programming for the, to meet the individual students' needs. We are designing engaging, relevant experiences for our students. We want to seek community business involvement, strengthen the partnerships with our families, increase the district capacity with our agencies, and uh, implement the transition services training, beginning with PPCD. It's too late when there's a 12 to 15 year wait list for programs to wait until parents when their child is 13 years old. We have to start with PPCD, and that's uh, a design that or purposefully we're going to be doing that. Um, we look forward to continuing to provide our transition students with these elements as part of their programming and plan to strengthen each one as we take advantage of the benefits of centralizing our program. Remember that our overreaching goal, is, as Debbie mentioned, is that the last day of public school looks like the first day of the rest of our students' lives. So what is PPCD again? That's our little ones, uh, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. That's the time to start telling parents about services that have 10 to 12 to 15-year wait lists in Texas. It's sad. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to share with you this evening. I want to thank Debbie for her expertise, her valuable and insightful uh, contributions this spring. She's helped us stay focused on the programming, the curriculum, when we're thinking about flagpoles and <laughs> trash cans. So, do you have any questions for us? How many students will be accommodated at the Transition Center? About 115, but I'm receiving phone calls daily from families that have been in private school, in uh, homeschooled, and live today. I talked with a lady in Illinois that uh, are, they're making the decision to move to this area because of the programming that we're going to be able to provide to our 18 to 22 year olds. And so any student who lives in the district would qualify whether they had gone through Plano schools before that or not? Yes, and, and that's a discussion I've had with Region 10. How do we handle this? And if a student already has their diploma from private school, from a uh, homeschool program, 
they are able, and they're 18 to 22 year old, and they qualify for additional services, an ARD committee will determine that, they would be allowed to come into the transition program. We do not have to worry about then giving them a Plano uh, diploma because they already have one from the program they've been in. We have some students that will need to go back and finish maybe a few uh, that don't have that diploma yet, and they'll need to finish some of their courses at the 11th and 12th grade level, and then they'll come join us if they still qualify. What's the probability that we outgrow it before we even open the doors? Um, you know, right now my possibilities serves over 200 students a day, and we're starting off. You know, I, I don't think we're going to outgrow it before we there. Ask me in five years. <laughs> so let me ask a clarifying question with regard to students you're talking about who may be coming in from private school or from home school. These are students that are within our boundaries. They live in Plano okay. ISD boundaries, yes. And you said you thought the capacity was maybe 200? I, my possibilities maybe has maybe even 250 because students come and go during the day. There's 400. Oh, 400? Well, she's on the board. She knows. They serve 400 um, individuals a week. A week. Oh, a week. Okay. Because students come and go, they yeah. maybe come two yeah. days a week there, three days they're somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And they have half-day programs. So I think we're going to be... We are filling the building right off the bat. Have we talked to my possibilities about the traffic around the building and what is the best um, opportunity for pickup and, you know. Yes, we have. Because I've, I've been there and it's yes. crowded. And they've told us the route we need to take, which means we also need to order signs that tell the drivers where to, what direction to go. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I just want to say this is an exciting moment for Plano SD to have this a transition program. And thank you so much, Debbie Wills, for being here and for your expertise. Well, it is my passion. <laughs> so, okay, before we move on, we've got two more reports. Do we need to take five? Okay, five, five, not ten, five. <laughs> All right, Dan, you ready? I'm ready. All right, so Dan Armstrong, Assistant Superintendent for Technology Services, will introduce the Monday and Sunday plans regarding the District 1 to Web Technology Initiative and the metrics utilized to gauge its success. Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Stolle. This evening, I'd like to invite Mr. Matt Fry, our Executive Director for Instructional Technology, to come to the podium and share with you our report regarding the District 1 to Web project. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, Vice President Stolle, Superintendent Bonzer, trustees. The last time Dan and I stepped to this podium, the, the digital ink was still wet on our brand new technology plan. It was August 8, 2017, and we were talking about one to web for the very first time. And we were sort of promising a seismic shift in Plano ISD's computer allocation strategy. And had he been here that night, author Jim Collins might have called it a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG, right? After all, he had just announced, we had just announced our intention to nearly double the number of computers on campuses without impacting a budget that was largely built around the idea of just replacing existing computers, half as many. Fast forward to today, and you'll find that we've already distributed some 35,000 Chromebooks across 67 campuses. In fact, more than half of those campuses, 34 to be exact, um, those highlighted, in fact, in green on your screen, uh, they have received their total one-to-web package, their complete Chromebook allocation. It's a quantity slightly greater than the number of students enrolled on those campuses. But while the number of Chromebooks in circulation may be a leading indicator of our progress towards success, it's the lagging indicators that we clamor for, uh, that we anticipate, that we sweat over. Uh, devices, after all, are just part of an amalgam of techie things that combine to sort of create our digital plumbing system. In computers, you'll never hear me say differently. They are absolutely necessary as our wireless access points and projectors and switches and routers and Cat5 cables and all of those things. But by themselves, uh, 
those things are wholly insufficient. It's the stuff that's enabled because of that digital plumbing that makes all the difference in the world to us. So nine, nine months ago, we started to unpack and examine the monday Sunday dichotomy. We understood then, as we do now, that deeply integrating new learning technologies into classrooms will require substantial shifts in teacher practices and even ideology. And those shifts, they're going to take time, they're going to take effort and intentionality. The skills needed to leverage a class set of Chromebooks for differentiation and acceleration, remediation, collaboration, all of the shuns, those skills don't just magically appear. They aren't manifested simply because of proximity to a new set of Chromebooks. Right? Our aim is, and it always has been, to start building those skills into our collective instructional repertoire so that someday we're in a position to maximize technology's full potential for learning. But before someday arrives, we've got to prepare for and otherwise contend with Monday because it's coming quickly. In fact, as you saw for so many of our schools, that day has already arrived. And while we may not be able to fully maximize technology's potential on this very first day, on this Monday, please know that we're still accomplishing some pretty compelling things in my estimation. And our time together tonight is limited, somewhat fleeting, so I want to circle back to something I mentioned earlier, uh, leading and lagging indicators. A few weeks ago, more than 250 PISD administrators gathered at the Sockwell Center for a workshop focused on high reliability schools. It was during that training when the facilitator spoke about using leading and lagging indicators to sort of manage and predict academic success. Leading indicators are, are more or less preconditions that help us know whether or not we're on track toward meeting a goal. Leading indicators for academic achievement may include attendance rates, informative assessment data, a slew of other metrics that likely keep Dr. Dash, if we're here, he's probably up right now thinking about those metrics, <laughs> right? And conversely, lagging indicators are related to outputs. And for academic goals, they likely include state assessment data, star data, graduation rates, dropout rates, and the like. And it was at the last board meeting, the very beginning, the room was filled with students who earned the right to compete at the National Speech and Debate Tournament in Fort Lauderdale. And I would submit that that kind of accomplishment is the best lagging indicator of all. Tonight, during recognitions, significant lagging indicators, the kind of output that we're looking for. And so the leading and lagging indicators associated with our One to Web project are a little different, perhaps nuanced. Uh, our preconditions or leading indicators include de device deployment numbers, uh, training, basic utilization metrics. My team, some of them here tonight, uh, they call me a report nerd. Uh, I choose to believe it's a term of endearment, right? Uh, I get rightly sort of jazzed up when we reach a record high for daily logins into something or another. Um, so much so that I usually have to send Dan a text message the moment it happens. Uh, this is a screenshot of a text I sent Dan back in October when I was over the moon happy with our new record of 16,000 logins to WebDesk in a single day. That's our single, single sign-on portal. And here I am in April, a full six months later, still sending texts after noticing another new login record. Uh, what is that, 35-ish? That So I, you know, in my notes, not on Dan's script, I sent him another text last night because we eclipsed even that number and we continued to, to go on that trajectory. So I, I suppose the reason that we get so geeked over these numbers and other leading indicators is because we know uh, they are precursors to the really compelling stuff. These are gateway activities tracking toward the lagging indicators, things like the maturation of blended learning, technology literacy and digital citizenship, innovative practices, interest-driven exploration that's better enabled, perhaps best enabled because of the new and improved access that we provide to people and resources spread out across uh, the internet. And so in the time we have remaining tonight, I want to share with you some, I think, authentic examples of our one-to-web leading and lagging indicators. We'll start with a closed ticket, maybe the most mundane example I could come up with, but an important one nonetheless. This is only one of a bushel basket full of tickets that we opened and closed just this year. 
Tickets like this one for Jasper reflect the coming together of all sorts of people, all sorts of ideas, after conversations with school administrators, campus technology associates, we meticulously plot locations on a map, like what you see here, to make sure devices are delivered to the spaces where they'll do the most good. We track requisitions and purchase orders here. We make sure our internal and external deployment teams are scheduling and communicating effectively with our constituents. And while the physical distribution of assets is very much sort of choreographed and calculated, we are at the same time developing and delivering training to support classroom implementation. Effective professional learning, we all recognize, is another leading indicator. Instructional Technology's marquee professional learning event, known around the district as, as Etsy, takes place during the week of June 11th. A completely voluntary, sort of unpaid opportunity for teachers. We're thrilled that there are already more registrants than we have seats available. Interest is very high, and I'd like to think that such exuberance is in itself a leading indicator. Good things to come. And so I am absolutely a sucker for tweets that capture evidence of leading indicators and look at that face. Uh, in fact, look at all of those faces after learning about the really cool things Chromebooks can do when paired with WebDesk. Those smiles, I would suggest, are indicative of good things to come. And I love this one. I love all of these pictures, but this one is special to me because I had a front row seat to watch the story sort of unfold. Several times this year, we hosted a very diverse representative committee of more than 20 members, each one charged with considering various facets of teaching and learning with technology. And they were teachers and librarians and school administrators, curriculum coordinators and instructional specialists. They represented lots of different subjects, lots of different grade levels, came from elementary, middle, high, and senior high schools. The conversations were rich, and they gave me every confidence, again, that our Sunday is going to be as bright as anything. And I love the partnership that's growing between the academic services team and the technology services team. On February 19th, just this most recent one, during a designated professional learning day, Whitney Evans and several hundred secondary math teachers filled the classrooms up the street at Plano Senior High School to take a deep dive into the new affordances of Chromebooks in the mathematics classroom. There were lots of breakout sessions, as you can see, lots to choose from, and I know unequivocally that students have already encountered changes that are derivative of that event and others like it that occurred on that same day, different subject areas, different campuses. Let me shift gears just a little bit. Here's one of the utilization reports. This is how I earned my report nerd title. Uh, we run this kind of report occasionally. It shows the number of logins by school, by month, into our single sign-on platform. This report doesn't just count logins from Chromebooks, but from any device, any location, any time, 24-7, 365. And looking at this report, if you tilt your head just a little and, and squint, you can kind of begin to see the moment in time when teachers and students start to really leverage the digital tools and content that are being made available. Do you have a line for the logins from Russia? I do not. <laughs> they are not getting into our single sign-on platform. So is the, 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 the discrepancy between Frankfurt and Gulledge, for example, uh, did, was Gulledge distributed the year before? Yes. Okay. When you see a big disparity yeah. like what you're suggesting, it, it would indicate uh, typically in Frankfurt, for example, that's the month that we sort of... Yeah. Yeah. Gulledge was among the first eight... They were in their first dozen schools because of their renovation that occurred. Mm -hmm. So it was appropriate to give them their full allocation instead of putting desktop furniture back into their campus. So I also get a charge out of looking at year-on-year -year aggregate reports. Last February 2017, our teachers and students combined to launch 34,000 applications from our single sign-on portal. I, I can suspect back in February I thought that number was nothing to sneeze at. Um, this February 2018, that number eclipsed 720,000. That's in that same single month. And we just recorded nearly 760,000 application, application launches in April. 
Uh, those are, in my estimation, leading indicators. And just because big numbers are cool, I thought I'd point out this one. Uh, on April 16th, the day I took this green grab, our technology using students and staff had launched more than 4.3 million applications through WebDesk since the first day of school, since August 1st, actually. So um, how many applications do they have access to? That is an interesting question. <laughs> so there are a lot, it's, it's, but it's kind of the, one of the things that I love about this portal, this, our single sign-on portal. There are premium applications, things that we pay for, things that will be on your agenda next month that we renew. And then there are applications that effectively students and teachers can self-select. There are literally thousands of tiles, single sign-on tiles, each of these applications represented pictorially, that, that we can place, a student can place his or her own, a teacher can distribute a tile to a class, or from a district level, we can distribute those by profile, student group, grade level. So there are all kinds of, so there are thousands. Okay. So, I mean, to put it yeah. in layman's term, it's like getting your phone and your map app is automatically put on there and you can go to the app store and put on more apps. That is exactly. Okay. But you, you actually support certain apps, but not all apps. Correct. Because there would be no way you could support those self-selected apps. We try, <laughs> we, uh, but, but yes. Now, what's interesting though, sorry, Dan. The off <laughs> <laughs> is, that you can, is that we get to see those applications that we don't provide, but are valued by our constituents, you know, that, like you see, gosh, what on earth is this thing? And then I let, you can click and see who's using it. And typically you'll find um, schools, specific schools, where that's very prominent within there, but not others. And that's an opportunity, if it's good, just to right. investigate, and if it's good, you share that message. Interesting. Did I talk about big numbers being cool? Yeah. <laughs> And whereas leading indicators are more about access to resources and teacher behaviors, the lagging indicators are more about the technology-fueled things that students are doing. And so in this first example, we see Jasper students in a geography class using their Chromebooks and an application called Nearpod to interact with content. Nearpod is a new software tool we introduced this year. We introduced the premium version this year. It's been around for a while, but we invested in it this year uh, to help teachers take advantage of those class sets of Chromebooks. And while Nearpod utilization was solid during the first semester, notice what happened in February, the same month that included a designated professional learning day dedicated to using this kind of tool with students. Look at February. The blue bar indicates that twice as many students had joined a teacher-led Nearpod lesson, and I view this as a very positive lagging indicator. So that was actually going to be my question, which is when you add apps to the store, how do you get the word out and how do you make it known so that people can access them and you know, something new and exciting gets added? That, so that is uh, you know, one of the best ways to advertise. Honest to Pete, if, it, if an icon shows up on, a, on a, your web desk, I, you know, I'm betting you're going to click on it. And so one of the things that we do, frankly, is, is it will be a, a, a school or a group of teachers will ask for an application to be put on their student's web desk. And we have the ability to push that out and then the marketing occurs within that school. But then there are enterprise level applications that we go through the normal channels. In fact, tomorrow, I mean, so I'll announce we, we added a new uh, tile to the principal's dashboard that they may have noticed last night when we added it there, but it's in fact called Cla uh, ClassLink Analytics. So they will be able to, so we'll talk about it when we add a new app, now we'll talk about it tomorrow. Hey, you may have noticed this, and what it does is it gives you a glimpse into the activity occurring uh, on your campus. What are your students, what are your teachers accessing? So that's, so that's kind of how it happens. It's different all over the place. There are, there are only a very small handful of, I would call, enterprise apps that go on everybody's thing. And then everything else is one-offs and there are small marketing efforts, I think, on campuses. 
So are y'all doing any kind of like a video tutorial or something like that that allows people to access the app and then essentially learn on their own how to use it? There, there is a great program, project, led, spearheaded by one of our, I call them uh, digital learning specialists, one of the instructional technology specialists, Nancy, Nancy Watson. Uh, it's called CLIC, P-I-S-D, CLIC. And it's actually students creating those screencasts, how to use these apps. And we post, we publish those. And the idea is to get students to teach other students how to use those applications. So the library, it feels like I'm making this number up, 400. That may or may not be uh, the number of tutorials we have. But it feels right. It feels like that's how many we have. So they're on any, basically they center on those things that we, uh, that are prominent in our digital environment. So we have the, lots of those. Yeah, and one of the other items, just so you know, the quick tip was one of them that we put out there and without even, you know, instructing the folks other than them being, hearing the information from the other channels, uh, instantly started gravitating to it and were utilizing it through the web desk also. The web desk is what we're going to be collapsing all of the services onto so that not just students but staff can access it on whichever device from wherever they're at. So I, I know that Missy's concern, and I kind of shared the same concern, was pushing these things out and then them not being utilized because nobody knows how to, to utilize them. But it sounds to me like through your efforts, as well as sort of just uh, you know growing on its own, of its own accord, it's just exponentially blowing up. Well, and, and that's something to note because what we're illustrating right here with the Nearpod was after, it wasn't a technology, this was actually a curriculum uh, initiative, uh, but that was making the difference with the Nearpod app being utilized in the classrooms. But that wasn't really, like I said, it was when Whitney and, and her group got together and some of the other curriculum groups got together and had a, and had a district-wide event uh, that's how we're seeing those indicators come up and showing its utilization. But now we're actually, now that we're collapsing it all, we can take better metrics of what's working and honestly we'll be able to see what's not working. It's uh, things having to do with Venus. It's Venusian, is that, does that sound right? It's like a Venusian Monday, like a, like a Monday, you know, everybody's having a Monday. It's like, it takes 167 days, if I remember, to, for Venus. That's the length of a day, our day, you know, a, a single day is 167 days. So we've had, we've had like a different Monday for a different school every other day, every other week. So it's not like on one day, everybody, 35,000 Chromebooks mm -hmm. dropped, right? So it's this Venusian Monday deal where we get to have these uh, everybody experiences a Monday on a different day. Does that make, does that kind of, I don't know. You have to look up that fact. Too. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yes, you yes. Going. And so uh, here's a snapshot from Phoebe Cho's third grade class at Razor Elementary as she facilitates a little blended learning. Uh, and then there is uh, this picture of two young Sigler stars who gained access to a couple of Chromebooks before school even started simply because they wanted to explore Google Earth. And the students at Davis Elementary are using their new Chromebooks to write plays and to create presentations and to access the Dreambox math platform. The lagging indicators are also showing up at Sagling Elementary where fifth grade students are using Chromebooks and Google Classroom to create, and I quote, based right on what the tweet says, historical research magic. That's something I need to follow up on. And I'll end by showing a 30 second video that a colleague recorded one day when I visited Hedgecoke's uh, elementary. I think we talked about the last time we were here, we had this, we were trying to break the internet on this particular day. We were testing that out. So please don't look for great teaching. You'll understand in a second. I happen to be the, the guy uh, leading the class. Um, instead, I want you to listen to the excitement that bubbles up from these students when I ask them to join me underwater to interact with a coral reef. Okay, so that's the context. Now, I think I have to click a button this time. And with your fingers, can you move around and can you pinch 
function and can you zoom out? So, I mean, you know, just, I listened to that one particular kid. I don't know if you heard him or her, but that, the arc on that inflection or whatever, I, I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, so I think excitement, joy, engagement, uh, these are some of the most compelling leading indicators we can hope for. Uh, and when those are clear and present in our classrooms, which I, you know, and I totally believe that they are, uh, I know the lagging indicators are gonna fall into place. And so Dan lost the coin flip an hour ago, and he'll answer all of your questions. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, you know, Dan, I remember uh, three years ago, we had a con right after I joined the board, we had a conversation. I just got my Chromebook, and uh, I, I thought that that's what we need to put in all of our, all of our schools. I didn't imagine that three years later we're going to be sitting down now as with so many schools having those Chromebooks. Um, you know, one of the next steps I hope is that uh, we're going to get all of the uh, all of our textbooks digital. You know, I, I brought it up and I'll bring it up again. I think we're going to talk about that in June. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, today I saw another doctor with my daughter. Uh, because of back pain and uh, on the way over there, I picked up her backpack. I had to wait when we got home. It was 26 pounds. Oh, She's carrying 26 pounds. Why? Because we have a lot of textbooks. And uh, I really hope that uh, as we adopt more and more of this, uh, we're going to have more and more online. Uh, I really like the way you look at the leading and lagging indicators. Uh, sometimes if you just wait for the lagging indicators, it's going to take a while. If you know what's going to be building towards the lagging indicator you're looking for, uh, and you're looking at the leading indicators that get you there, uh, I think that's really important. The uh, analysis of data, I think, is great. Um, <laughs> one last comment. Uh, you, you have infectious enthusiasm. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, as an aside, I, sh I should tell you that when, when I look at the data and uh, among the top 10 applications that are being accessed across the district, K-12, um, Pearson it ranks among them and so does McGraw-Hill Connect Ed. So, right. so, th so yeah. those are very prominent. Uh, and and we, that's part of the conversation we have with uh, academic services and the adoption process is to make sure that those publishers practice sound interoperability uh, practices um, and subscribe to, so we can make them available that way. And by the way, when you said in that video that uh, don't expect uh, high quality teaching, you, when you look at the responses from the kids, this is high quality teaching. I want to thank you, Dan, for sort of calling the audible about three years ago because we were on a pathway to put desktops in schools and schools that had recently received new desktops were not going to get any of the new technology for years and some of those were our schools most in need. So I thank you for, you know, lying on your feet and changing the plan so all these kids who need it the most can have this technology. Well, thank you and um, like I said, we're getting prepped for next year and we've got some really exciting things on the way. Any additional questions or comments? Thank you all. Thank you. Randy, see if you can make the budget just as exciting as that. <laughs> I, I don't think I can. <laughs> Let Matt present it. <laughs> so tonight we, uh, we have the 2018-2019 preliminary budget report. Uh, th this is not an action item. I expect the uh, proposed budget that we bring to you on June 12th to be the same or very similar numbers uh, to what we're going to look at tonight. The, uh, so this budget process started back uh, pretty much in December when, uh, when we did look at the budget goals for 2018-2019. I do want to point out on the third one as far as maintain competitive employee compensation. Uh, that was approved uh, previously in this board meeting and this budget does include a two percent general pay increase uh, for our employees uh, 
the next slide here. Uh, so these are the budget initiatives by board goals that we looked at on the April 24th meeting. Uh, these have all been included into this preliminary budget that we'll be looking at. Uh, you do have handouts also, I believe at your place. You should have a general fund budget, a debt service budget, and a food service budget. And we're gonna start with the general fund. Uh, within that general fund, first I'll, I'll just hit some highlights and we can look at some numbers. The tax revenue increase in that general fund is 45.6 million. Uh, from last year's and that's comparing last year's original approved budget to this preliminary budget um, interest revenue increase is 3.5 million we all know that interest rates are up and so we've we've had a we project a stronger year next year as far as interest income uh, state revenue increase is up 6.7 million that's because it's the second year of the biennium and the the available school fund amount per capita is higher uh, during this year uh, as far as expenditures, uh, the 2% general pay increase was approximately 6.5 million. Uh, we added uh, approximately 2.1 million for new positions. Recapture has increased 57.4 million. And, and that's where we get the difference between tax revenue being up and recapture being up more. Uh, and then we also added 1.7 million for security initiatives that we talked about at the that was the April 24th board meeting. Um, just big picture, when we look at the preliminary budget, the revenues are 697.7 million. The appropriations and other uses combined are the total expenditures at 700.7 million, and it is a deficit budget of just over 3 million. Uh, in the last meeting on April 24th, we were talking about a six to six and a half million dollar deficit. Uh, we did tie that up as best we could. A, a lot of that is on positions, um, just being sure that we didn't have any excess positions budgeted, but also in some of those, the, w let's just take an example of a 30-year teacher that uh, when we were looking at this a month or two ago may have now retired, and so now we've rebudgeted that um, at the budget control point um, the budget vacancy factor and so that's a lesser number and so there's been some changes like that that have occurred uh, even though three three and a half million dollars is a whole lot of money when you're looking at 700 million it's about half a percent of the budget that it's changed uh, from the last time that we talked but it did change in our favor so that's always a good thing uh, if, if you'll go to this other sheet again I'll hit this really quick as far as the handout that you have on the general fund uh, total local revenues are up 62 million. That's about 11% increase. Total state revenues are up about 8.1. Uh, and again, that is primarily the available school fund. Total revenues are up 11.35%. Uh, expenditures, a uh, couple of categories. The, uh, if I can read these, social work services is up 22%. That's for the additional social workers uh, that, that we did plan that we did uh, incorporate into the budget. Uh, you can see that transportation is down. Uh, another one of the reasons, another means that we did use to close that gap. Uh, transportation, just due to the number of vacancies that they have in the past, that's been budgeted 100%, assuming a 100% fill rate on bus drivers and bus uh, monitors. Uh, that isn't reasonable in today's unemployment market. And so we did go in and trim that down. So even though we've added a few more bus drivers uh, to open the adult transition center and giving a pay raise up to a $16.75 starting pay to try to be competitive with our neighbors, we were still able to trim total transportation by over a million. And so that one should come in tighter this year. Uh, let's see, security is up 38.7. We know why that is, no secrets there. Uh, purchase of water is up 38.1 percent from the 150.5 that was in the original budget last year to about 208 million projected for the coming year and appraisal district costs are up 14.61 percent and that is uh, just because the school district continues to become a larger percentage of the total tax collections and that's how that's prorated out um, we, we do get a credit for a portion of that on our chapter 41 payment. Uh, so total uh, 
expenditures are up about 10.6 percent and the uh, again the bottom line so last year's original budget was about a 6.8 million dollar deficit and this one uh, at preliminary is just over just over three and so it's uh, actually an improvement of almost 3.8 million over the original budget from last year are there any questions on the general fund we will bring these in more detail at the next meeting more of an editorial comment even though social work is up 22 percent that's on a really small base that's four hundred thousand dollars in a district that desperately needs that help I, I would also say that still as a administration and, a, and as a board we haven't made dramatic changes in how we're spending our money i think it's about two to three million dollars that are going to the equity programs in total and so as you've just articulated on a base of 700 million dollars that's half a percentage point point four percent so we still have a way to go before we're really differentiating in how we're providing our services and i know this is a year where we're doing a lot of study a lot of planning a lot of training to increase capacity um, but at some point we're going to have to see some dollars moving if we're really going to make gains with our focus schools and our other schools that are underperforming so i guess one more year of patience but at some point we're going to have to start shaking these numbers up if we're going to help all of our kids succeed so here tammy here's the the problem and i i don't disagree with you but the problem is that this is a zero-sum game and if we are going to increase somewhere else we've got to decrease somewhere else and so i i looked at these numbers a little bit differently and shared this with with randy i i ran these numbers <clears throat> with each line item as a percentage of revenue and then compared that year over year and we are basically flat in every single category uh year over year even the one that's 22 percent you know social services like you said it's such a small portion year over year it's not a very big increase as percentage of revenue the two biggest movers were a five percent increase in our recapture payment and a four percent increase in the amount we're spending on instruction line item 11 now um, i was, was talking to sarah about that and part of that is the savings that y'all found in in eliminating some of these positions but that zero sum gain that, that's why i keep going back to recapture as that gets bigger we have to come out of pocket somewhere else to pay for it and th again that just cannot continue that's not a reason not to continue to try to help and reallocate and no no I totally agree I just mean it's a it's a It'll be it's painful a, it is will be painful and it's a it is it's just a zero-sum math it's zero-sum math so we've got to take away from somewhere else if we're going to put more in elsewhere well that's why the district of innovation is so important in order to have even flexibility with class ratios if you have a homogeneous class that's all high performing maybe you could have 23 kids in that class versus having to keep it at 22. so we're going to have to look hard and making those sort of transitions okay any other questions on general fund okay debt service the uh total projected revenues is 143.8 million appropriations are the same that would be a balanced budget uh, we predict the ending fund balance as of june 30 of 18 at 40.7 million and with that being a balanced budget the estimated fund balance in the following year would be that same amount uh, we do have to carry quite a bit of fund balance because we're a june 30 fiscal year in and uh, we do have august interest payments uh, and so a, a large portion of that uh, i think approximately half of that goes for those august interest payments and, and so honestly it's a little bit uh, deceiving when you're on a june 30 how much fund balance you have in a debt service fund uh, you also have a, a budget a more detailed budget uh, on the debt service fund uh, and so the current year revenues are 131.948 million those are projected to go to 143.859 and expenditures are the same uh, there there is one thing i'd like to discuss briefly here uh, which would be a little bit of a shift in philosophy here at Plano ISD and so historically the interest that's been earned in the construction fund has been transferred back into debt service to make principal and interest payments that that's that 1.7 number that you see on the left that was what was budgeted in the current year budget for 17-18 uh, uh, you can see we've put that at zero for 18-19 and, and a couple of or, or at least one thought there what 
one is it's a little bit unique uh, to, to transfer that money back over to the debt service fund. There, there's not anything wrong with that. Uh, typically that interest uh, is used for construction projects and especially in an environment like we're currently in where construction costs, I mean, our architects are telling us somewhere between eight and 15% per year. That is significantly higher than what was predicted and projected and budgeted in the bond. Uh, so if we did not transfer, uh, let me back up again. On 17, 18, that was budgeted at 1.7 million on interest that would be transferred back. That number is actually gonna be approximately 4 million just because interest rates are even higher than projected. If we did not transfer that $4 million back into the debt service fund, uh, Linda looked at those numbers today, and it looks like we would still have a positive increase to fund balance of about $600,000 in 1718. That, that doesn't mean that money can ever be transferred back, but it means we could keep it in the construction fund, continue to monitor our construction projects, uh, we, we are getting growingly concerned that we're going to have to start scaling back construction projects uh, that were factored into the bond just because construction costs are rising so quickly. Uh, if at the end of the day we, we did have a surplus there, we, we've got some options there. We don't have to issue all the bonds because we're issuing them periodically. And so we, we, we could still, if we did come out better, we could still, it would have the same impact as taking that money and paying debt with it. It would just be later down the road. Or even if there's additional money left, if we had issued all the bonds, uh, we could use that money in a bond refunding to pay debt down. So, so it still doesn't take away what we're doing. It just, it, it basically prolongs it. it. It gives us more time to evaluate what are construction costs doing. And so we, we, we're actually proposing, unless you tell us otherwise, in a budget amendment that will come back to you on June 12th on the current year, would be to eliminate that 1.7 million that's transferring back in. And again, that the fund balance is still projected to increase in the debt service fund. And in 1819, even if we issue additional bonds uh, with an 8% growth factor, uh, we could we still project that we can break even in the debt service fund without any interest being transferred back in Does so if i'm understanding sense? you correctly i mean essentially that just gives us more flexibility that's correct to it to really almost like a contingency fund that's correct okay. randy how is the distribution between uh, principal and interest changing between 1718 and 1819 I mean, that would just go back to, you know, we've got multiple outstanding bonds and just the way each one is structured. Uh, within the refundings that have occurred recently, mm -hmm. uh, as any time you try to do a refunding, you try to move more towards principal because you're typically right. getting a better interest rate. And just the structure of that, there is pretty significant benefit in 1819 on the way those bonds have been financed. Okay, so it's just kicking in 1819. Do you think that we're, we can keep that ratio? of more than two to one in uh, principal to interest? I think if you continue to look out on the life of those bonds, that will continue to improve every year. Okay. I don't know that it will continue to improve at that ratio, mm -hmm. but I, I believe that will continue to improve every year. Randy, as a favor, as someone who's more of a visual and an auditory learner, and since it's almost 10 o'clock, could you actually put that in a written documentation so we can kind of see the flows that you're talking about? That would be helpful for me. I sure can. As far as the transfer, mm -hmm. yes, I sure can. And I visited with Mr. Fortenberry about this last week I'm, because, I, like I said, it is somewhat unique, and I think it's, it's been the practice here a long time. But as far as he knows, it's not a policy. It's not a procedure. It's strictly been a practice. Well, if it is a policy or a procedure, I think we would want to entertain whether or not that needs to change because having more flexibility, having a contingency fund, so to speak, to, to address rising construction costs is the prudent thing to do. Right. That would be our recommendation. Okay, so we will we'll look into that deeper. We'll get some correspondence out. Thank you. Clearly spell that out. Any other questions on debt service? And quickly on food service. Uh, total revenue is 24, just under 25 million. Uh, expenditures 26.5. Uh, it would be a deficit budget of just over 1.5 million. However, they typically do 
come in better than budget. Uh, the estimated fund balance as of June 30 of this year is just over seven million. And the fund balance, if that deficit was realized, would be about five and a half million. Uh, that, that's still a strong fund balance in a food service fund. Any questions on that one? And you do have the detail, but it's, uh, there's not a lot of line items in the food service budget. And that is all I have, unless there's any other questions. Anybody have anything else? Well, you did make it just as exciting as Matt's presentation, so thank you. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on then to policies. Uh, at most of our regular meetings, we have policies on the agenda for the board's consideration. These policies have undergone prior review by the district's attorney and by each board member. I invite Carla Oliver to introduce the policies we have on the agenda this evening. Ms. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Stolle. First, we have DEC local compensation and benefits. Uh, leaves, and that leaves and absences, it's presented for approval under first reading this evening and will be presented for adoption under a second reading at a subsequent meeting. Do I have a motion to approve on first reading? I move that we approve DEC local on first reading. Is there a second? I second what she said. All in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Ms. Oliver. Thank you. Our next policy is FL Local. Student records is presented for approval under first reading and will be presented for adoption under second reading at a subsequent meeting. I do want to bring your attention to um, one piece that in your first, the first materials that you received or may have seen, there's a policy reference in there to DBAA exhibit and I wanted to let you know that it was posted, the, cor the correction was made and the, po the policy reference, the correct reference is GBAA. It doesn't, it doesn't inherently change what you're looking at tonight, but I just wanted to make you aware of that one edit. So we should be able to approve this as posted? Correct. Okay, do I have a motion? I move that we approve FL local on first reading. Second. All right, all in favor? Motion passes unanimously. No speakers, correct? No speakers. With no further business, this meeting of the Board of Trustees is adjourned at 9.58 p.m.